Welcome to Classical Reflections. This is Jesse Kraft. Today is a special episode. I am joined by a very dear friend of mine, uh, Luke Amadeus Ranieri, who also goes by the name Lucius Amadeus. Does he say Ranieros? <laughs> or is it just Ranieri? Or uh, he has the other name of Scorpio Martianus. Uh, good, good, uh, good friend of mine. He is a, um, Luke is a Latinist. He is a polyglot, um, speaks multiple languages. Um, I believe he will list those off for us in the, um, in the podcast today. Um, Luke got his, uh, got a degree in geological sciences from uh, Lehigh University, uh, then went on to continue his studies of, geolo- of the geolog- uh, geological sciences at San Diego State University. Um, he has done some uh, some PhD uh, work towards uh, towards that very um, towards that very topic of the geological sciences, but I believe he was focusing um, with a focus on uh, the study of Mars, uh, the the Martian planet there. Apart from his work in the geological sciences. He is a military pilot and officer, um, flies um, helicopters, which is <laughs> awesome, right? Uh, and, and additionally, um, so he's an independent scholar, and his research spans historical linguistics, uh, sound changes, and the study of, uh, of meter, uh, specifically in Latin meter. So in this podcast, uh, Luke joins me to, we wanted to have a, we had a discussion about a question he had brought up some time ago on, uh, I believe he started on Facebook and then it carried over to YouTube and there was a lot of uh, a back and forth conversation with different different Latinists, different teachers about um, about his question, like what is Latin? What what does it mean? How, how do we define it? How should we... And should we do anything differently about what we're in the way, what we're teaching, and the way we're teaching it? Right. Um, one of the central questions, I suppose, and and we'll address this um, only briefly here. And I get, I might say that it's one of at least two, maybe more take-home messages. Something to ponder is whether or not we should restrict our instruction of Latin to the classical period, you know, sometime around 100 BC to roughly 100 AD. Should we restrict should restrict that Latin there? And, and Luke will throw some numbers our way, citing that roughly 1% of, of Latin literature comes from that period. So there is just a plethora of, of Latin that, that we are, that we're ignoring, that we are paying no mind to. And the question is, is is that okay? Are we justified in that decision? Is that right? Should we be doing that? Should we be actively ignoring the literature that's out there? I don't know. I personally am of the opinion that, that we should not ignore that. But at the same time, I don't necessarily know how best to incorporate that into the classroom, especially since our current classrooms, especially at the, let's say, the lower levels. So from your elementary to your middle to your high school, um, at those levels, everything is still geared around that classical period. Our curricula, the curriculums that we're, that we're teaching from are still oriented that way. And so it's a bit hard to break from that mold, is it not? To to just say I'm gonna I'm gonna change and and start incorporating incorporating more uh, more Latin. Now I should say though that people are moving that direction. I mean, a lot of uh, a lot of teachers are now using um, Latin, which is being written today. I've written some uh, novels, um, well, novellae, sorry, uh, little texts. Uh, Daniel Pedersen, whom I will mention later on, he's written some. Uh, another good friend of ours, uh, Chris, uh, 
uh, Christopher has written um, written some texts. Uh, I mean, there's 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 just so many of us who are writing writing materials now that are suited for those lower levels of Latin, you know, Latin one, Latin two, Latin three, Latin four, and that's not classical Latin. Eh, I mean, we're trying to follow, so we're trying to follow classical precepts, right? And then we're trying to imitate those to the best of our ability, but we aren't native speakers of the language. We're foreigners to that language. And so no one is is going to likely be able to produce a truly a truly native uh, styled and leveled material. I mean, there certainly are those who are going to get very close, but it still boils down to the fact that they're not native speakers and they're likely will never again be native speakers. Um, unless there's some families who are teaching their children Latin, but then again, I mean, the Latin that those kids are hearing is not coming from native speakers. So can we call that? native then i don't know these are all questions that maybe not may not be entirely relevant um but at any rate trying to determine which period of uh, of the class of of antiquity we should use or not use and which texts which authors should we use not use in our um, in our in our instruction that's the that's really the central question now, in this podcast, too, so you'll hear us discuss that. You'll also hear me uh, flailing a little bit and <laughs> as, I, as I struggle to accept my own shortcomings in the uh, pronunciation of nas- nasalized M. <laughs> um, it's, it, it's one of those things that you know eventually happens. We know that that's going the M on the end of words from the accusative case, right, is going to uh, eventually drop off. We know it. We see it in all the in the in the Romance languages, but it's just it's hard to swallow that pill, and then it's 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 even harder to reproduce it to retrain yourself to uh, to pronounce it properly. Also, it's not something that's widely accepted yet, right? And Luke is doing an amazing job of trying to. So he studied this material um, ad nauseum, and is is really trying to help us those of us who are speaking this language and who are teaching this language to help us teach a more accurate, what we think to be a more accurate representation of the language, right? And so he's doing a fantastic job uh, in that. Now, uh, there, there will be a time when, when he and I will, will kind of butt heads, but we're, we're really close friends. And so um, that sort of thing uh, happens and should happen, I think. And that's, uh, that's healthy. Um, but um but we uh, we bring it on back though, and uh, and 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 we know that we're working for one cause, and that is for the for the spread of the uh, of the the learning, the teaching of of Latin, and we want to see it improved. We want to see people speaking better as best as they can, right? Reading and writing as best as they can uh, this uh, this beautiful, wonderful uh, language. So I guess one of the other take-home messages from this, and then I will um, then I'll. I'll go ahead and stop here and then let us get on with the uh, with the podcast is so no one is perfect right now Luke will admit this I readily admit this please just watch any of my videos especially my earlier uh, uh, Magista Craft videos and you'll see uh, regrettably there are little pronunciation uh, mistakes here and there or or even a, a misused word I've tried to go back and fix these things but um, at any rate, you just press forward, right? You accept the mistake and, and you move on, and and that's what that's what that's what uh, what Luke and I sort of sort of end with, you know. Something I said a moment ago: we are all foreign speakers of Latin, right? And so it is great to have this idea of sort of a perfect language and its concepts and precepts and and the rules and regulations and the norms and things that we should be following and working diligently hard uh, diligently towards um replicating and emulating but it's not always going to be possible our language will likely not always be accurate and maybe not always sound native there will be some variances here and there and I think that what we're what we're saying is is that that's okay, that's okay. I mean, 
we mentioned this in the podcast a little too, but one thing that all of you teachers and all of you um, aspiring Latinists should uh, should bear in mind, at least those of you who don't already think of this, is that, you know, in ancient Rome, there were no doubt so many variations of pronunciation. I don't necessarily mean among the ruling, the rich ruling class, that 1% of literature that we have today, but I'm talking about all the people who weren't writing. The plebs, right? All those, all those folks who just filled the streets were speaking in ways that were just comprehensible, sure, but they were, they're humans and they're expressions of, of self, right? These variances, these sounds that we, these utterances that we make are an expression of who we are, where we come from, right? How we think. And, and so when you're, when you, you are yourself struggling, working extremely hard to produce the, the, the highest quality of Latin that you can, just bear in mind though, that It'll be okay, right? We will have our moments where we each fail here and there, but ultimately, though, as long as we're doing due diligence, working working hard to to be the best that we can, but that means truly doing it though, so through research and through constant practice and so on, then those those little blips should uh, should be nothing more than encouragement for us that we are doing what is right and that. We are moving in the right direction. We are indeed making forward progress. So, anyways, that's my little, uh, I guess, uh, PSA, little public service announcement there for you all. Um, so, without further delay, I bring to you uh, Luke Ranieri. Welcome to uh, Classical Reflections, guys. This is this is a special one. Um, I will have uh, I will have given a, a proper introduction to you, of course, leading up to this. But, I love um, your future perfect there, by the way. Oh yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Um, <laughs> so if you don't recognize that uh, that sweet baritone, um, that is none other than uh, Lucius Amadeus Ranieri or Luke. Howdy, Ranieri. Hey, buddy. Howdy, partners. How are you, man? <laughs> I am very well. I rushed in the door after work to continue a discussion which we have begun through audio messages for, during the day, and now we get to talk about them face to face, so to speak. Um, before we jump into that, though, can we can we address how um, how strange this is going to be for some people to oh, yeah. hear the two of us? Now they've heard me speak in English before. They've heard you speak in English before. But they're here not to, at the same time. Not at the same time and not with each other. Right. So it's going to be a little That's different, right. yeah. All of our Italian friends will be like, <laughs> oh, they speak English. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> they, will be, they will be amazed. In the, in the Latin friends? What would the Latin friend? Ah, lo, uh, lo cuntor. <laughs> lo cuntor. Oh, <laughs> they speak English. <laughs> So you're saying it's the same. That's how Latin speakers sound, right? It's, it's no different than the Italians. <laughs> Dude, but can we? Uh, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, one one thing I like to do with uh, with classical reflections is uh, I like to kind of like tell people how we came to know each other, and and I. You approached me to start a podcast in Latin because we were both going to be giving talks at the Carreco Latino Vivo seminar of 2018 in Naples in March. And so in early January, uh, you said, um, how about we start a podcast together? That could be fun. It would be a great way to practice. And I was like, yeah, that'd be great. You got a YouTube channel. I got a YouTube channel. Let's do it. Was that the first thing I said to you, though? Like, <laughs> that I was just... the first thing. John Piero's John Piero told me that mm -hmm. uh, Jesse, I would love to imitate his accent, but I don't want to offend him. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, let's not offend <laughs> Well, he doesn't speak to me in English, but I would, that's, how I would, that's how I imagine him if he were to speak English. <laughs> uh, but anyway, he would say, um, yeah, you should definitely get to know this Jesse Kraft who's going to be coming to the Greco Latino Vivo seminar yeah. in Naples. And I was like, oh, let me check this guy out. Oh, he's got a YouTube channel. Oh, he does Roman architecture. I love <laughs> Roman architecture. And he's speaking in Latin. This is a cool dude. He's a big geek. And then, yeah. Yeah. And then I got to talk with you and found that we were brothers from other mothers. Oh, man. 
and it's been yeah. like it's been framor. <laughs> it's been yep. Uh, well, what's that song? Uh, uh, oh gosh, something about bromance. I can't remember. Let's go. Let's insert the word bromance, and that that'll that's that sums bad up. romance. That's almost the same thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, maybe that's what I was thinking of. I definitely had a Lady, a Lady Gaga song in my head, but I was thinking more like Poker Face. But that that, that wouldn't work. Poker Face. Oh, I messed it up. Bro, 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 That doesn't work, but it's okay. So we're a natural pair, everyone. Thank you for listening to us on Legio Tertia Decima. Shameless plug. Plug it. Yeah. What is that? What do we do there, man? Well, uh, well, they go to youtube.com slash <laughs> legio, looks like legio, X-I-I-I, which is Roman numeral 13, legio tertia tequima, legion 13, legio 13, and we talk about all kinds of things. In Latin, we talk about phrases that are useful to know in Latin. Mm-hmm. We are actually starting to teach Italian in Latin, which is useful because we're both Italian speakers, of course. Yeah, and you do Greek with uh, Andrew Morehouse. Um, yes, Greek do, lessons. Do, uh, I would do every single episode. Episode, excuse me, excuse my pronunciation there. I would do every <laughs> single episode with you. That would be the uh, the um, Ionic Greek dialect of episode. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, I would do every episode with you, plus our guests, if uh, if it were possible. But of course, you have a wonderful family, and I do not. So I managed to find time to put out uh, some other episodes, and it's nice well, to have. Uh, it's a family in in absentia. Well. In in absentia. Well, I will be in absentia it's presently, soon to come. and you'll be and you'll be doing some with uh, some other people, which is awesome. Yeah, I'm gonna and gonna fly solo. I'm kind of kind of nervous. It's going to be, it's going to be fun. So how did you, can you share with folks, um, how you, how and when and why and all that stuff you got into, uh, into Latin? Oh yeah. That why is a, is a moving target as we say in the military, it keeps Mm. changing. Um, Mm. but, uh, I, the reasons now are for, I, above all for friendship and for fun. And a lot of you out there who may be interested in Latin, hopefully will find fun in it above all else. But uh, yeah, I started back in 2005. I had already spent a semester in Italy. I'd become fluent at that point. And I was planning to return in the fall. I wanted to take Florence University mm-hmm. classes. I wanted to take Latin literature. I wanted to take Greek. And I was like, and I, well, I really study Latin at some, in some way. I didn't necessarily know what level, but um, I had taken one semester, a year and a half prior, my first semester of college. It was with Wheelock, and this is Latin, I mean, and it was tedious, and I didn't like it, and I'm like, Bleh. so I, uh, however, I ended up Googling uh, ways to learn Latin. I think Google did exist back then. I was going to say, was Google a thing back then? <laughs> I'm, well, was that or Alta Vista? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Or Internet <laughs> Explorer Maybe it was or whatever. Netscape. Yeah. <laughs> It was one of those, but um, I uh, so I found the Dowling method, Latin by the Dowling method, and that page is still around, um, and uh, basically talks about okay, here is the basic grammar structure of Latin. Here's what these cases mean. This is just a simple summary, like a few pages. And now here's what you should do: memorize the summary of forms that's in the back of the Wheelock book or the back of any book. Our book in uh, Familia Romana of the Lingua Latina yeah. Per Se Illustrata series has the same summary of forms. Me- basically, memorize that and then start the Lingua Latina series. Mm. And this method happened to work for me. I don't necessarily recommend the brute memorization, rewriting 80 times of all of those paradigms, but I did. And I was 20 and I had energy and, you know, um, <laughs> didn't know what else to do with my life at the time. I didn't play video games, so why not? <laughs> and I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up uh, doing that, and then Familia Romana, already knowing Italian. This is the summer of 2005, they, and I wasn't back in Italy. I was back in America. And those three months, I decided this book is the key. I transcribed every word of it, every long mark, because I thought, oh, these long vowels must be important to pronunciation. I want to learn that, too. So I learned all of, um, all of that, and so I transcribed every sentence, including all the exercises, at least once. That's crazy. Familia Romana. Yeah. It is crazy, and I don't recommend it necessarily. It did work for me at that mm-hmm. time. I don't mm-hmm. know if I would actually want to do that at age 34. But uh, 14 years ago, it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> and um, in my 35th year, which is 34, as they say in Latin, being in uh-huh. my 35th year. 
And um, <laughs> so I, I did that after that. I, I always wanted to speak it. I was very interested in the sound of the language mm. and of language in general. Um, I was very attracted to my, uh, my father's roots in the sense of his side of the family. He's, he being yeah. a first generation Italian American, both his parents were from Italy. I didn't get to meet my grandparents, so I kind of wanted to recapture that. And mm. Latin seemed like a natural evolution, especially after living in Florence, seeing Latin inscriptions in the city and be like, oh, I wonder what that says. So that's how it started, uh, wanting to speak it. And now, uh, many years later, having gone to Conventicola, having gone to uh, one, at least one Biduum now, the Biduum, Biduum Coloratanum, the Colorado Biduum of the uh, Salvi organization, and having been to these events, and now these, are these wonderful colloquia that happen three times a week, uh, which are uh, available to anyone to, who wants to come and try to, or, uh, try to speak Latin with others. We have those now. So anyway, now it's very different. Now it's like I like sharing ideas and my videos on YouTube, and I just enjoy having a good time with people laughing and Latin, telling jokes and Latin. So anyway, that's the bookends of it. But then you went on and and you picked up. You didn't mention this, but um, along the way somewhere, you picked up several other languages um, and and a few of them to uh, to fluency. Um, mm. What 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 was uh, was that a a similar? Did you kind of use a similar method to pick up those languages or? Mm. Oh, that's go a good it? question. Yeah, yeah. So uh, and what are those Italian, languages? Italian, obviously. Oh, sorry, you're going to well, say. Well, I mean, oh no, well, yeah. Let's let's so after Italian, right then Latin. So Oven just been was working on Latin for maybe five years total, four years from '05 to '09, and then the past mm. two years I've been at it again, but nothing in between. In between, I was mostly in Japan. Uh, that's the more recent one. I was, was stationed in Japan, so I learned Japanese while I was there, and I started teaching it at a basic level. Where were you? Uh, where were you stationed? Do. Were you like a Christian ministry? I. Oh, I, thank you for asking. Um, you right. can't, all can't see. I, I'm I can see the my, camouflage. Yeah, <laughs> Jesse can see me in my uniform, which I, <laughs> I haven't taken off yet since I just came home from from work. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm um, currently an Army National Guard officer, and at the time I was an Air Force uh, active duty officer, and I was stationed in Japan. So um, yeah, and I, the job I was doing was eh, wasn't really exactly what I wanted to be doing with my uh, military career. So I threw mm -hmm. myself into something else I loved, which was learning languages. And so I got to have lots of um, opportunities to meet Japanese people and to learn the language. And it was really interesting. And Latin and Japanese have a lot of very interesting things in common. So does ancient Greek and Japanese, which um, that's they're, cool. They're interesting. We can talk about them. Yeah, it is cool. Yeah, it really was yeah. informative. Like, oh, here's like a living language example of this stuff that I've heard about. Um, like uh, specifically vowel length and pitch accent. That's just not uh, a length, actually. That's not a comparison that you often hear. Oh, you know, ancient Greek, Japanese. Those are those are similar in in some ways. Yeah, you yeah. don't. Yeah, you don't yeah, hear that by coincidence, of course, not by any uh, connection. Yeah. yeah. But uh, so there, it's interesting how languages can end up being similar, yet being yet be very far apart geographically and through time and. All that. Like, well, I mean, who's uh, speaking yeah. these languages, right? Humans, right? I mean, certainly that has to have, mm -hmm. has to play some role in some of these similarities, right? right? Yeah, yeah. And then there's Klingon. And, and then there's that, which is like, <laughs> which, <laughs> not I mean, a human I studied language. A bit of, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're they're designed to be a little bit eth like ethereal in the case of the Elvish, or very inhuman, very non-human the way the Klingon is structured. But those are interesting and. Um, anyway, uh, but I don't know those very well. I just uh, have studied them because I think they're neat. Otherwise, uh, French is very similar to Italian. I, uh, many people believe that superficial similarities between Spanish and Italian make them most similar, uh, but I disagree, although there are lots of similarities. I think French mm -hmm. grammatically and in its vocabulary, like manger and mangiare, which means to eat in both languages are the same. But Spanish has comer, and they take from different Latin roots, of course. The comer mm -hmm. is from... Uh, comesse or comedere, and then the uh, the mangiare from manducare, mm -hmm. which is the Latin for to chaw on, to gnaw on. I love that <laughs> <word>. manducare. <laughs> Augustus says it in one of his letters. He says manducare. I forget, like manducawi or something. Like I was chawing on something. I love, it's I really love, nice. I love Augustus. I love that. Yeah. Those little registers and stuff. Uh, French. So Spanish, I was able to pick up. I haven't done too much work with Spanish, uh, French. A couple years ago, I got to C1. I probably reduced back to B2 at this point. Oh, these are this is the European scale of right. um, mm -hmm. I forget what it's called, but A1 is raw beginner, C2 is near native proficiency, 
um, you and I are C2 Italian, for example, and yes. you, you're actually pr certainly further. It does go farther than that, but there aren't necessarily tests uh, for it that are easy to get. But mm. um, uh, So what else? I've studied Portuguese, and I can understand it easily to read, but I can't really talk, and I don't have the experience. Um, studied Romanian. I did get conversational two years ago, but I haven't touched it since then. I've studied a bit of Russian, a bit of Polish, uh, thanks to an awesome friend of ours, Jan Oko, who also has a Latin YouTube channel. And uh, what else? A bit of Croatian, all thanks to another Latin speaker of ours, Nives Ursa, who's uh, oh, Croatian, yeah, taught yeah. me a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she sings in Latin, has a YouTube channel as well. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, what uh, looked at? I've l looked at um, modern uh, Irish Gaelic. I've looked at uh, Scots being the dialect from Middle English. I've looked at uh, Middle English, Old English, Old Norse, um, a little bit of everything. Um, yeah. In varying levels of detail, but oh, in modern Greek, I started learning modern Greek and ancient Greek. I've studied a bit as well, so a lot of dabbling. Um, but Italian, Latin, French, I say my. Oh yeah, I studied German in high school. Almost forgot. Sorry, my German friends. I should have known that. <laughs> yeah. So, so I was so fluent in German. It's, it's, so, it's, so rude. It's <laughs> too to be a light. I'm so sorry, my German friends. But I um, anyway, German in high school, and then uh, yeah, so I've been dabbling around uh, here and there. So you're a dabbler, yeah. So that's awesome, man. Dabbler. But so Latin is your, as you feel like that's you kind of feel like that's the um, the language that's that's called out to you the most, like that's your calling or something. Like, kind of, is that kind of you have something like that or? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it you it's really nice. It's uh, kind of big fish and small pond kind of thing. Anybody can really, um, kind of kind of like being in the colonies and uh, the Americas early on. Like anybody who could do a thing um yeah. was suddenly like the most you know famous or whatever a really <laughs> yeah. important person and you and i are um among a small number only 20 or so people actually have attempted to do channels in latin that are only mm -hmm. in latin you yes. me, daniel Pedersen are are three of the um um more well-known ones i think but uh well uh, alexander so like, oh. no his podcast is in excuse me his youtube channel is in italian isn't it it's not in he, Latin. Yeah, he actually he's only he's done very little in Latin, a couple songs, but mostly Italian, which is. But all his Latin stuff's on Podomatic or, right? That uh, podcast. Uh, yes. Website. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sermones Raidari. Yeah, which those are very good too. We, yeah, we recommend those as well. Oh, I love that podcast. Yeah. Yeah, I love Alexander. So man, can we um, there the other day there was not the other day maybe it was a, a week or so ago well I mean maybe even a little bit longer than that ago. <clears throat> There was like a little conversation that uh, that had 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 sparked up, had 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 grown, had had become something bigger than I don't know what <laughs> on Facebook. Of course, isn't that where isn't that the where Beatles? things? <laughs> yeah, bigger than the Beatles. Isn't that where stuff happens? <laughs> like like <laughs> on Facebook, you have huge arguments and huge debates on Facebook. My God, but um, it was ah. yeah, it was about uh, Latinitas, right? It was like. What is? Well, I don't recall what the central question was. It was something like, "What is was Latin?" Was my question? Was that? I thought this was my instigation. If it was someone oh, else, had you, had you, you're then. the one who started this up. Okay, good. Yeah. So, can, what was? I'm your, pretty sure it was me. So, what was the uh, um, the rough? Yeah. So, listen. Well, the well, what? So, you and I are Latin speakers, and there are somewhere between ten and a hundred thousand of us who speak Latin in the world. Um, the numbers, I, well, that's one of my goals actually to get accurate, somewhat accurate statistics where we can have like definable numbers, but this is just a raw estimation. But once you start meeting people and you find that, oh, there's a lot of us. So there's a lot of us out there who speak Latin. So what does that mean? So we're using a language which is ancient. Um, there, there are definitions of dead and living language. I, I don't like these terms at all. Dead, living, extinct. I mean, they're just like, they're, they're talking about the living species or living animals and ascribing them to a language, which is just a tool of communication and a natural ability of human beings. I don't think they're really appropriate. But according to some definitions of um, uh, the uh, living language has to be one mm -hmm. where there are native speakers. Mm -hmm. Kaire. Kaire, but according to, to some definitions? 
Right, according to some definitions, a living language has to have native speakers. Uh, according to others, the living language has to have speakers. I prefer the latter. Um, it's, the, the, it, they're just not useful, in my opinion. Because Latin continues to flourish, in fact, in some ways increases in importance in the world after native speakers have gone away, after the end mm. of the Roman Empire yeah. and the Romance languages at the vernacular level have <clears throat> completely taken over. But Latin continues to be the language of erudition. So then we have uh, these various periods, right? We have medieval Latin, there's late Latin, medieval Latin, Renaissance Latin. The medieval Latin in particular is often criticized. I have not read that much medieval Latin, but what I've read has been, that I've seen, have been sampled by people like Terence Tunberg and mm. by the Paideia Institute, and they seem awesome. They seem very comparable in quality to the ancient stuff and to the Renaissance stuff where they quote-unquote purify. I'm using finger quotes, you can't hear them. Yes, um, I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse can see them. Uh, I'm using finger quotes. Uh, these, uh, these purifying, these trying to make the Latin be more standardized. So why, why do that? Well, Latin uniquely, while it was in a, the living standard language of the, um, or native language, let's say, of the Romans, of the Roman Empire, was standardized already by the first century BC. Yeah. So it continues to be this one singular form. And that's not unique necessarily. Um, standard Italian, for example, was standardized basically 700 years ago, 600, 700 years ago, with Petrarch. At least it's based on the model of Petrarch, mostly, less than on, not as much on Dante. And that is really the standard form of um, the quote-unquote Italian language, which is, of course, a dialect of Tuscan, uh, which, or in Florentine, more accurately. But Dante, you know, beautified, he brought in other dialects, and, you know, he made this wonderful art language. You know, I can't think of any other time a language has been created exclusively for the purpose of literature, for art. Mm. And uh, as Dante did, which is very interesting. Uh, and uh, which is interesting because Dante in his uh, De Vulgari Eloquencia, he rails against uh, the... <laughs> he rails against the idea that why should we speak any other language but with one another in formal settings than the, the one that we speak with our nursemaids? He talked like this. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I am gesticulating my yeah. hands. <laughs> and, uh, you know, why, uh, why do that? And it's, uh, he th we therefore thought that Latin was an artificial thing imposed upon the people of his time. And for he also thought that was true of Virgil. Mm. He thought that, mm. you know, the, the idea of massive change in the world wasn't very uh, clear to people back then. So he assumed Virgil natively spoke Mantova, uh, Mantovan, so Mantovano, which is a dialect which existed in the 1300s and still exists in a, a similar form today. So that and, in that case, ahead. sorry, so you're saying um, it that he would have been speaking a regional dialect and that the Latin that ends up being published, that he uses to publish with later, was kind of like a, mm, pardon the uh, expression, or not the expression, but the analogy. So it's kind of like a, a teleprompters. So you see some a telejournalist like they're using their version of, of English or we go to Italy and they're using their version of Italian. Or if we have a Latin speaker, right, you've got this Roman individual who gives out the news and it's a very clean cut and they follow the kind of rules and regulations of quote unquote proper right. Latin. Is that, is that what you mean? His imagination of, yeah, well, his imagination of the ancient world was that uh, Cicero <laughs> and Virgil and all these people at home or in, with their families, they spoke whatever native language of their town and with the common people. Mm. But in the formal settings and business, whatever, just like in the thir year 1300 mm -hmm. in Florence, Latin was that language that was written down and there, you, no one was writing down the vernacular. That's what his supposition was. It's not correct, of course, but... Well, how do you... Okay, idea. so that's... You, you said... I was going to ask it, but I, I kind of... <laughs> I was going to... So why do you... Why do you think that that is... That is wrong. Why is that incorrect to say that that Cicero may have had his own sort of house language, familiar language, language of love, but then once he was outside of that atmosphere and in the public sphere, that he would have, have switched? Why is that not mm. feasible? Yeah, there's that, that's a really interesting question, and um, some of it comes down to. So, of course, we're talking about what languages exist in the Roman Empire, right? And certainly in Italy yes. at that time. Before the dominance of the city of Rome over the entire peninsula, there are languages like Ascan and Umbrian, yeah. uh, Etruscan, which is not a, related to those. It's not an Italic <coughs> language. 
and the Greek in the Magna Grecia and the southern Italian right. region. So these things are all mixed together, and they all do um, uh, contribute. I was going to say contribute, like because I was watching Game of Thrones. <laughs> they all contribute. They all contribute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's my American there uh, to the to the tapestry, to the language, but fairly little, which is interesting, that as far as we can, well, the language is very standardized by the beginning of the first century BC. Latin, Latin. I mean. mm-hmm. Right. And because of that, it which not only because of that, but very interestingly, the language almost doesn't vary at all for 2,000 years, including these places in the Roman Empire. There's a great book about the regional variation of the Latin language, which J.N. Adams has uh, put together, and I've been reading that book for some time, recommended to me by Terence Thunberg. He said, oh, I think this would be interesting to you, he said. And then I have. And interestingly, the conclusion is essentially that there wasn't very much regional variation, and people strove uh, in th- from the Republic, through the late empire, assiduously to eliminate any foreign accent they might have or, mm. foreign, um, or foreign dialect. So that's, that's interesting. It gives... It gives some value to the idea that we should be using one language. So you asked me, why did I bring up the question, and I had a YouTube video on my Polymathy channel about this. What is the Latin? Like, what the heck is it? What is it? Is right. it this yeah. thing that's very narrow, which I'm making a gesture with my hands you can't see? It's, or yeah. is it very broad, <laughs> with my hands spread apart? Again, gesturing uh, big, yes. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's like, where, where, how do we... Um, uh, do we for, and the whole point of this is that Latin is narrowly defined in one way and broadly in another, narrowly defined, it's the language of the first century BC. And everyone who, after, who imitated it properly is also speaking and writing in Latin. And those who deviate by certain degrees would be considered not quite being there, although they'd be close. The broader definition would be inclusive to everything up to the very borders of true Romance language. Um, mm, being codified, mm, mm, such mm. as as Dante began to codify the Italian language or uh, Don Quixote with Spanish and uh, and others. So that's th- those are the and so somewhere in the middle um, uh, is the truth probably, or maybe it is the very limited one. There we have colleagues that say you know it has to be this. Limited. Not that you can't write stuff after the first century BC, but it has to be in the model in register and. Um, Elite in vocabulary, and that's what I mean by register, like what yes. kind of, yeah. Anyway, so I have more to say but on that, but uh, you, let's take go where you want to go. No, no, that's, um, let's go there because I'm, I mean, that opens up a lot of questions. I mean, so first of all, I, I'm just, I guess this will just be more of a statement than a question, I guess, is when thinking about those uh, medieval writers, um, I recently uh, translated a book um, from from Italian into English, but the author had, I don't know how many citations. She had many, many, many mm-hmm. citations that were from medieval Latin, or that they were, excuse me, they were medieval Latin uh, citations. And that's cool. They were very cool. But and I and I don't mind telling you though that. Um, so I had read a little bit of. Uh, I took a I took a sight reading uh, Latin sight reading class in college and. And that's the sight reading class. They had chosen medieval and Renaissance writers. And nice. that was, I, I remember having a good time there because much of it was like Italian. It was kind of like reading Italian with, uh, with Latin endings, you know, and it was just, it was just kind of nice. Yeah. Um, and that was also partly because of the authors that, um, that my uh, professor had chosen at the time. But when I got into this book though, um, translating this book in English, I found th- I found it the other side of the coin. So I found some authors who were writing in this very Italianate style, uh, but it just happened to have Italian, excuse me, Latin endings, uh, and, and of course like Latin vocabulary. But already you could see that there were some Italian words that were creeping in there. Um, you could see constructions that were being used that were more like Italian, more like a, a modern foreign language, and, and so on. Um, but then I did find some authors though who. Now here's my here's my impression. Now unfortunately I'm not a medievalist, medieval Latinist, and so unfortunately that's I don't I haven't really studied it enough to Michael Sweet will uh, could ask help us. Comments. Well, so here so yeah, Michael, then if you could help, <laughs> um, here's what I what I discovered is that some of them, or excuse me, this is my impression is that some of them, um, some of these authors were trying to repeat 
to imitate that good classical style, let's say that Ciceronian style, if, you, if we want to use him now for an example, but they were falling short of it, right? And, and in doing so, and in falling short, what they ended up doing was making this really sort of convoluted uh, language that seemed to be counterproductive, right? So uh, we've gone from seeking to be communicative, to get across some idea, some thought, whatever, um, and now we've gone into this, um, well, we were trying to, to oh, be flowy, flowery, beautiful, but we can't do that because it's, we, we haven't been practicing it long enough. We, we're not, we haven't mastered that skill yet. And so now Michael Sweet was talking about it's exactly a mess. this in a, it's a conversation mess. a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. He was talking about over like these exordia, these introductions to books being like they're supposed to, he's saying this is supposed to be a primer on Tacitus. But it's w harder to read than Tacitus. He's writing like Tacitus, so it's like this is not useful. It's someone who's trying to get into the language right. as a student, you would think. But, yes. Um, and my answer was, well, there must be been an audience for it. It's not useful to us as much. But, um, but Michael Sweets will, I'm sure, like to make some comments in this video about that. Yeah. So, I, uh, anyways, I he's just a Latin-speaking friend of ours. I just thought that was sort of uh, uh, that was just sort of sort of interesting as you were bringing that up. But mm. I mean. Yeah. So, what do we, um, what do we, what are we to make of this? I mean, if are, are, do you? I mean, should we limit our definition to what it, what Latin is? Should we limit it to just that? What? What do we say? Like the first century, roughly BC to roughly first century AD, plus or minus. Right. It's the idea of standardization of language, which is useful in yeah various societies, right? Sure. It's useful to have. Um, of course, we don't have one standard English. We have at least two major ones, obviously, our American and the British RP received pronunciation, but received pronunciation all, also includes um, dialects like word choice and things like that. Australian, of course, New Zealand, uh, Ireland, Scotland, and India are other poles in this great world. Welsh, we'll just throw that in there, Welsh version of English. I don't think there's properly a standard that I'm aware of, but... Um, uh, these standards exist. Of our language, language in particular, is highly uh, is as uh, multipolar, though no doubt um, compared to others. Whereas Italian is not. There's a one form of standard Italian that nobody speaks, but every foreigner is taught that. And and you know, I of course are Italian speakers, right? So we learn a standard Italian, and then of course you uh, know the Urbino. Uh, more with some familiarity. I'm a little bit familiar with Tuscan and to a much lesser degree with Salernitano and Neapolitan. And I love them all. And um, there's these varieties that exist, as, but there is always a standard language. So in Italy, all of the newscasters and the uh, reporters and the movie stars, they all learn the standard dialect. They try to reduce their dialect, their accent as well as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Their pronunciation, their word choice, when they're in these situations. Mm -hmm. And comedy is usually characterized by having those accents, right? And that's right, also yeah. true even in the ancient Roman examples too, which we can talk about like Plautus and, and oh, Petronius, that's another one who, mm -hmm. who, uh, who does that. So there, there's a standard language, like there's a standard French, which is based on uh, Parisian and uh, standard uh, German or Spanish um, and, uh, and so forth. So. Through these standard varieties, they don't preclude the obviousness of other varieties existing mm -hmm. alongside them. Um, but uh, anyway, so that get, that's, I think my question, though, when it comes to what is Latin, I want yes. to, because there's so much Latin to enjoy, right, but I yeah. want, you and I speak Latin almost on a, da on a daily basis, actually, both of us definitely mm -hmm. do, every day. And so if we speak Latin every day, what kind of Latin do we get to use? Do we get to use medievalisms and that's okay? Are we causing harm? Because if we're using a grammatical form, which is contrary to a standard rule, you and I are both Latin teachers, mm -hmm. then are we, wh are this deviation, what are we doing? So like if you and I are in Italy and we want to speak in a more Neapolitan way or a more Tuscan way, a more, um, a more uh, Umbrian way, then we are assimilating into that society for a bit. And that can be, you know, speaking language in the way another person speaks it is a great way to bring friendship. It's to bring this um, uh, affinity, which that was the word I was looking for. Mm, and yes. so uh, if and by obstinately 
only speaking in a formal way. For example, you with your uh, students, me with my coworkers. Yeah. If we spoke in the most formal way that we could, we'd alienate them. That's mm-hmm. not a good choice. That's right. not a good way to communicate. Mm-hmm. And so there's, I think that you and I were, uh, or you were actually talking to me in your message to me earlier about the um, code switching, which mm-hmm. of changing registers, yeah. um, mm-hmm. the register ch- change of being more casual, more formal. Yes. And yet, and that's not a one variation. There's so many variations. There's oh man, variations. yeah, and yes. In the same city, you can have different ones, especially London or um, New York, for example, sure. where there's so many. And uh, and so those those changes happen, and we choose them. Uh, so why should we, therefore, pi- be so rigid about one form? Anyway, that's the question. Yeah, I'd, I'd, should we be so rigid? I, I mean, I, I suppose I can see, I can certainly see arguments um, for either side. I mean, I certainly like having this, this one sort of isolated form of Latin that we can just. We don't. Oh, well, let's go. Let's go double check our sources. Like, let's go back into. Let's look in in Caesar. Let's look in Virgil. Let's look in, in any of these various authors of that time. And I mean, that's, that's really, it's convenient. It's, it's also in a way it's sort of comforting because you know that if you're using these terms, which are backed by these authors that you know that, that you're speaking Latin and that's, and that's good. I mean, and especially for someone who's just beginning to, to speak the language, right? You want to make sure, I mean, I remember, man, when I was first making my videos, I mean, I was new to speaking Latin and, and I mean, oh man, can, does it tell? Like you can, you can, you can see it, you can hear it. Certainly I can hear it. Um, in some of my earlier videos because I just didn't, there wasn't a confidence there. I was making these sort of basic similar, uh, simple errors, uh, left and right because I didn't have a register. I didn't have a timeline, a, a place of comfort, a security that I could just fall back on and say, all right, let me just pull from these sources here. Right. I was sure. kind of just, and pulling. you're already a fluent Italian speaker at the time, right? Right. And then that was kind of, so in one, right. as you will know, that's helpful, but that can also hurt you too, because mm. you have this other romance language going on the back of your mind. Your mind is already wired for it. And you right. sometimes use that to fill little holes that you have. Yeah. But sometimes it, a, a it works and sometimes work. not. It takes, uh, I think for me to get it past it has been the weekly contact with lots of people who are also speaking Latin mm. and almost none of whom who know Italian. So after a while, I got to hearing fluent speakers who are not using any Italianisms because they don't know Italian. Right. So just, and also the other podcasts, all yes. of which are great, outside of the uh, wonderful uh, Satora Langs by Irene Regini and Alessandro Conti, Alexander Veronensi is his uh, podcast. All the other podcasters are not Italian, and right. therefore they're not using Italianisms. They might use Spanishisms or Englishisms or Germanisms or whatever, whatever the they might is, uh, yeah. might have going on. But yeah. that at least gives some points of triangulation. And the really good speakers mm-hmm. have managed to not um, allow those things. Yes. Uh, we talked about Daniel Pedersen a while ago. He, for example, has perhaps the most Ciceronian speech of anyone living, um, both in defi- not just in uh, usage but also of pronunciation, no doubt. And, um, yeah, but uh, we can go to pronunciation or we're going to wait. Well, um, I mean, can we kind of return back for a second to that? Sure. Um, so, I mean, we, we've limited if, – if, so limiting Latin has its, has its benefits. But then also there are some drawbacks from that as well. I mean, I mean think of the plethora of, of material, uh, of expressions that you're, mm-hmm. sh- you're cutting out. Of of a human's right. ability to to use to effectively communicate, and I and I don't know that I'm okay with that necessarily. I'm not either. I'm, yeah. It, but it would come to, for example, if I were uh, uh, to say something stereotypical like uh, like righto or uh, what's something else or um, uh, that's a knife. Or so, that's an awful Australian accent. I'm sorry. I'm yeah, oh gosh. two oh gosh. or three Australian <laughs> you have Latin offended. speakers who know me. So <laughs> I'm so sorry. But um, for we're in Americans, obviously. So these things happen in our cinema and music and so forth. So our, our TV. So Or like in that Seinfeld episode where Elaine says, maybe the dingo ate your baby. Right? She's <laughs> right. doing in that Australian right. accent. Yeah, awful. Quote with, I'm using air quotes again, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Around Australian accent uh, <laughs> to the best of my ability to imitate this person doing a, a strong accent. Yeah. Yeah. So what is um, now that has a comic effect for us, right? Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the point 
that others, for example, a friend of ours, Patrick Owens, has made. If okay. we start to do things that deviate from the standard language, yes. we better do it knowingly and knowing that we're referencing something. For example, if we say something that's medieval, medieval construction would use quod, where, um, quote, where, using air quotes again, quote unquote standard Latin does not use quod to mean the conjunction that. It right, right. Accusative plus infinitive. Yes. Uh, to give an example. Puto quod tu optimus magisteres. I think that you are an awesome teacher. Yeah. Instead of puto te magistrum optimo esse. Mm -hmm, I think that mm -hmm. you're an awesome teacher. Yes. So the, the second one would be, quote unquote, standard correct Latin. And right. the former would be a medievalism based on the vernaculars of the Romance languages. Okay. German, for example, English that do that construction, the word with that con conjunction. So if we do that, I think it's appropriate that if our core or center is this first century BC, centered yes. around Cicero, Caesar, and others, if that's the, this is like normal, this doesn't have any, this isn't funny or sad or entertaining or poetic, it's just like this really clean, simple, narrow place to stand on. So if we bring in something far away that's medieval, then it, it should have the register of exactly that. It should feel medieval, not normal. Or if we take something from Plautus that's a joke, it should feel like a Plautine joke. Mm. It should not feel like a Cicero era joke necessarily. And so by doing that, by bringing in, so whereas you and I as English speakers, we can take these references from geographic distance. Yes. But in Latin, uh, there's, some, there's a little bit of geography, but it's mostly a distance of time mm, that okay. we deal with. Yes. So if I take a word like, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of one of those Apuleius words I was reading in uh, the Golden Ass, but well, um, so is Patrick then or ahead. Patrick who, or whoever? I mean, you you just you named him, and so I'll just throw his right. name out here. But we can just we can ditch the mm -hmm. name for a second and just say, yeah. are people like him? W w what are they proposing then? Are they saying that if you go to use a medievalism, what like in class that that you should say, I, hey guys, heads up, medievalism coming your way? Should you interrupt your right. speech well, to do it or? Yeah, and I'm also uh, expanding upon Patrick Owen's mm -hmm. uh, thesis. I don't know if he necessarily would go as far as I've said. He may not uh, even be that permissive to say it's okay to use something that's yeah. in our language that's outside of that realm because it's just hugely rich literature yes. to get a lot of stuff from. And if we read a lot, this is what Daniel Pedersen often says that we need to do, and I don't disagree with him, I just don't read as much as he does, that we need to read so much of this, like read every one of Cicero's letters, read all, right. you know, read all this stuff, and eventually we'll find everything that we need. Because you're talking about, we don't want to limit our ability to express ourselves. Sure. Uh, and I agree. I want to take advantage of all these things. Yes. And, uh, see, I want to have my cake and eat it too. Yeah. Yet there is a standard language, and it is that first century BC. So, like, we can, deviation from it is something to be done seldom perhaps or with mm -hmm. a very clear intent with okay. a comic dramatic refer uh, i was gonna say referential but i guess that's what i mean a referencing referential yeah mm -hmm. yeah so you mean like so in the like referential that could be an example that could be like a uh, teleponum right to, obviously they didn't have cell phones right so oh, well, when you well, go to that's, introduce that's like a neologism. Sure, but like even even introducing that though is clearly it doesn't fall within the register of the classical period, and so it absolutely does fall in the register of the classical period though. That's why it's okay. You mean We're the creation of the word, but not, not okay. the significance of the word. Well, but that's not the limitation. The limitation is not necessary. Neologisms are fine. Horace said, um, "Liquit semper quelicabit." It's always been allowed to create new words, and it will always be allowed to create new words. But according to certain precepts that Cicero, among others, Quintilian, all these people from the uh, classical period, mm -hmm. as it's called, which is first century BC, first century AD roughly, they, they lined out exactly how to create every new possible word or term we could use. Mm -hmm. And the book that I have often recommend to people, which is uh, Springhetti, Aemilius, or Aemilio Springhetti, who wrote uh, Institutione Stili Latini, Institutions of Latin Style, has a whole book of 400 pages telling you exactly how to create new words, uh, what words are not great. For example, one would that's not great would be teleponare, or telefonare, if you're to ph, make the ph like an f. Yeah. Um, that one's not okay. Why? Because Why? creating new verbs, like t temporal verbs, is mostly eschewed by the Romans, whereas they would prefer to use telepono vocare, or... Uh, compellere, compellare, I mean, and these various 
ways of, uh, of calling someone by means of a telephone. That's a more mm. in line with the style of Latin in its natural state in the first century BC and AD. Okay. That's why teleponare is not okay, but teleponum is completely classical in the sense of it being okay within the precepts. Like its construction is... Yeah. Uh -huh. Ah. Well, you know, so yeah. if, if it's really... That seems pretty cut and dry for me. So if that's really all we're talking about, then the net then that means we, as far as I can tell, have no limits then. Because as long as right. these neologisms are being created appropriately and according to sort of the classical formula, right, then there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to s express all any of these modern things, right? Yeah. Somebody asked me in the Abidu womb in Colorado, how do you say sushi? And I said, sushi. <laughs> <laughs> that it began a discussion about, um, uh, especially with food terms that are so unique and so alien. Yeah, you could use a circumlocutio, a circumlocution, to describe that thing. Um, you know, uh, piskis rakens or something. Uh, Recent that could fish. Totally, yeah, fresh fish. <laughs> that's where it's. I think that's where it's from, actually. By the way, rakens was first that's, described. That's uh, fantastic. Fresh fish. That's like great. Raw fish. That's you know not old and rotting <laughs> and like then it. came later to be fresh from battle like rechens uh, and then later came to be associated with time so our word recently uh, is, um and recent is yeah. basically having to do with fish. fish apparently i think that's sweet. the etymology but i'd have to look it up Double again. anyway a sweet sweet fish sweet sweet sushi <laughs> recent california roll get that recent that. fish <laughs> <laughs> oh. may i have some recent fish please <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um so the uh and well, there were like pizza. I think, yeah, it was Alexander Weronensis who found the word pizza in a glossary of terms of, of just a couple hundred years ago. So that, what is, so neolit, so as opposed to the term placenta or placenta neapolitana, mm -hmm. which I detest because placenta means cake. It does mm -hmm. not mean pizza. Pizza is a unique thing. So we can use a quercum locutio, but just to call it placenta, to call pizza placenta, it does right. not square well with with me because it's a it's a cake and it's from greek by the way um it's i think it's placus and then placentos and then placenta became the standardized yeah. uh, form uh later something like that so anyway i th this is um it's not really that big of a deal we can import words but if we do it willy-nilly well it not let then it's going to get to be um like there are limits anyway and getting a sense of that is definitely more art than science but I, again i'd say i maybe i should translate from latin into english this book by Emilius Emilius Springhetti which talks about this in such detail because it's um there's a lot there there's a lot there which gives a person after a while a sense of what at least he thinks are the ways to go about noare about making new words yes um anyway no well so i mean that means um Clearly, I don't. So, having never studied that, and just like so many other people, um, having never studied, that really means that they're that task will fall onto a select number of people who, mm -hmm. and I, I'm sure that they know who they are. They know that they're capable of doing this, and they probably already do it to some extent, anyways. So, mm -hmm. um, fellas, ladies, gentlemen, whoever you are, hello. I think mean, it's everyone, man. Get to a, a degree, we have to have some discernment. Get a move on it. Um, create these. <laughs> but there's a lot. There's a, we have that. We have. Um, well, we, you, we've mentioned him now, and Patrick. Oh, sorry, we keep saying your name. Um, he had the uh, what's that? Uh, Arumbratio, right? That lexicon. Oh yeah, the uh, Mor Morgan, uh, and he and he has continued it after uh, passing yes. of, uh, of the late professor. Yes. And it's online. It's the. Uh, I think it's. Neo, Neo Latin Lexicon. Yeah, I was just trying to pull org, it up. I believe. Yeah, Neo Latin Lexicon dot org, and it's the Lexicon uh, Morganianum, and that's how it's how it's called by by some of us. So yeah, and it has a bit of everything. And what's great is it has all the things that are within the realm of being used: the Renaissance stuff and the classical yes. stuff, and mm -hmm. all these different possibilities. And with and caveats are also written in there about yeah, this is kind of like uh, but this is kind of uh, you know, those are yeah those are the feelings that put into the. <laughs> I've uh, I've pulled up the, the pulled up the site and I was just looking. So he's got like a plus sign will uh, indicate it, it is a medieval medieval word first found from 700 to 1400, and then a modern word 
would be from the 1400s uh, up to the modern right. day. Uh, and so yeah. he's given you all these these places. Here's a good word. Here's an, an okay word. Here's a not a great word, but it's been used once or twice, right? So that's really helpful too. Um, right. Because we're dealing with a language which is highly, highly standardized. Right. And every time we use a word, if its validity is definite as being an okay word or phrase, even a locution, a yes. new phrase. Like if we make up an idiom, like, um, uh, for example, uh, it, it's what's, uh, I don't know, what would be a good, good one? I'm trying to think of one. Um, oh, for example, long story short is one that we've talked about before. So I could say, fabula brevi, fabula brevi facta or something would be a way to say a long story made short. Mm. And that might make sense to English speakers. However, there's already an idiom for that in Latin, which is ne multa. Ne multa that would be long story short or to make a long story short. Mm -hmm. And that's the idiom for that in Latin, which is why yes. I've been just kind of obsessed lately. And I'm holding up now a book yes. of these very idioms, <laughs> um, which is by, uh, by um, Fra uh, Franciscus Morales Ardaya. Mm -hmm. Not by him, but he's just collected them. Yes. So these idioms already exist, not only in the Roman period, but there are medieval ones mm. and Renaissance ones. Erasmus has a bunch which have been rolled into what Latin is. And, you know, whatever it Latin is supposed to be, it's depending how limited right. it may be. So there's already a Latin way that exists. So we yes. should not create new things. And that's why, and uh, Katarzyna Ochman, our uh, Polish friend who's a fantastic Latin speaker and also has a YouTube channel, and she said that we just need to read more of this Renaissance stuff and this late Latin, this late Latin, well, also late Latin, medieval Latin, and I mean, late, uh, later, more recent, contemporary yes. Latin stuff done by these really great authors because they have already found solutions that we, in our ignorance, being, for example, classically trained uh, teachers in high school or college who have never deigned to look at the medieval or Renaissance stuff uh, because mm. we disregard it or because our interests are entirely with the Romans, which is fine. And then we want to, oh, we want to speak a, this language and make Latin really living and vital again. Let's do it. But but is there a word for that? Like, how would you say that? Like, I've had a lot of... <laughs> I've, once Absolutely. in a while, I've, I come across one of these uh, lovely people who I can't think of an example, but I might use a word that has become part of our vernacular. And one would be, oh, I, yes, I have a good example. It would be something like um, prosopo biblium, right. which is our neologism for Facebook created by Luigi Meraglia himself. And he is one of those severiores, as Springhetti calls him, one of these more severe, which is a good thing. It's, it's not a criticism. It's good to be more severior, to be um, more severe in one's discernment, to an extent, for sure, because then, if it's okay with that person, then it's probably okay for all of us. Yes. So in a neologism for Facebook, which becomes useful for us, because saying Facebook is our American English pronunciation, it's not the same in other versions of English, and it's definitely not the same in Italian. Facebook, right? Like, that's pretty much the proper Italian pronunciation. It's, uh, it's Facebook in German, you know, and you have these uh, different variations. So that's a problem already. That's why these neologisms don't work as well, because of the pronunciation not being the same um, in different, wherever these people come from. So, Because if you or I say Facebook, it sounds wrong to an Italian Latin speaker because to them Facebook sounds correct and that requires a v different diphthong, requires a voiced S and a different, like all the vowels are different and half the consonants are different. It's definitely not the same. Whereas if we all say prosopo biblium, we might have a variation of accent in that but it's much more standardized. Uh, so there's usefulness in that. Moreover, why is that word okay? So I've mentioned that word and then someone might be think, oh, I'm clever and I'm going to think, no, nah, I don't think that's good. Using Greek, no, that's not okay, which is not true. Greek is used all the time for neologisms oh, yeah. in yeah. classical Latin. And so... Um, Cicero well, did it, uh, who like, Pliny, uh, uh, the Emperor Augustus did it. I mean, so many... Right. So such a person would come up with Liber Facierum, the Book of Faces, which is fine, but there's already this word that exists in contemporary Latin, meaning mm -hmm. 20th, and 20th, uh, 20th and 21st century Latin, that exists... So let's use that one. We don't, and someone who only has that classical, very narrow experience and now just wants to start speaking Latin yes. is 
ignorant, meaning ignorance, meaning just not knowing just not, about mm-hmm. what is already there. And we, yes. all of us who are in that position, who are speaking Latin today, if we haven't read all this stuff, which is Katarzyna Ochman's point, then we're, there is some clever, and there is a lot of technological change in the preceding centuries and a lot of Latin to describe all that. Isaac Newton and Absolutely, yeah. and all these others. So. But, you know, I think you kind of, uh, I think you touched on the reason why that happened. And, and it's, um, it has a lot to do with the way Latin used to be, uh, well, it still is, but it was primarily taught for the past, what, 100 some odd years. And, and it was re- relegated to the classical period. And anything outside of that right. was ridiculed. I, you know what? There was a time when I used to say, oh, those, look, at, look at those idiots. They're out there speaking Latin. What are they doing? It's like. That's you not know what real. I mean? That's not real. It's foolish, man. It's dead. Yeah. Leave it alone. You know, and and then mm-hmm. so, and we have this. They had this problem, and, and and so now we've lost all of this literature. Well, we haven't lost it. It's still there. Um, Our contact. We, with we it lost. Has been separated. It's been separated. We. I've lost time. We have I could appreciate it. Oh my gosh! Like I could have. Do you know how much better my Latin would be today had I just been guided in the right direction at an earlier point? Well, and that's okay. Us, man. And that's true of all of us. That's yeah. okay. But like. I think I think now that we are we are opening we're opening our eyes to this and realizing what we've been missing out on and where to go get this information from I think I think soon like today or like actually soon like yesterday soon we need to start redefining Latin right which is why you brought up this question but not just not just for the sake of for our sake but like for the sake of schools what is it that we're actually teaching why are we teaching yeah. this and so that would that could help us determine do we want to just stay classically chained down and just remain in the first of the first centuries do we or do we want to open up and start including these other authors because right. when you look at a school curriculum the what is the primarily they're trying to get you uh, within three years prepared so that in your fourth year of high yeah. school, four years, so you've only had three years of language. So by your fourth year that you are able to read Julius Caesar and Virgil. I still don't find him comfortable. I'm, I can read Cicero and Virgil more easily than I can read Caesar, frankly. Man, and I'm a that, soldier. And that, that, <laughs> it's just, it's, it's so crazy because there's just like, there's so much vocabulary. There's so many nuances. Yeah. There's so much, uh, so much foreign grammar, especially when we get into Virgil and he's using like and, a Greek and that's accusative. The concept is translate with a dictionary. They're trying to teach you to use a dictionary. And Alexander Veronensis has frequently right. railed against this um, problem. I think it's I think it's worse in Italy than it is here overall. But Greco Latino Vivo and Alexander Veronensis, among others, have been doing oh, a lot I, of great stuff to reverse I mean, that. I, I mean, I, I can assure you, I, I, bef- let's see, I've been doing uh, this sort of spoken Latin now for, what, three years? And prior to that, I was only doing... It's great for three years. I didn't think it was so short for you. Yeah. I've only been doing... Uh, so then prior to that, I was doing grammar translation. And and that was my world. And that was, those are the people that I was in contact with, man. And it's and there are people just as, as adamant about that as, uh, as some of my uh, Italian colleagues with whom I'm still in contact with. Um, who are currently teaching and still using, yeah. but it, it, maybe not necessarily because they want to, but just because that's that's what their their school system mandates, right? And so, I think it's so silly too, because Italian is so similar to Latin. like, and I get it. I mean, it's like trying to speak maybe Middle English for you or me. It's actually maybe I don't know something like that. It would be similar but weird, and I don't know. I think Italians are the most ingrado and the most capable of being able to uh, excellently produce the best. Yeah kind of of latin but anyway that's it's just a short yeah. transition just a little step to the left and you and you're basically to left, to left, you're basically speaking latin dude. It's like, you can't see it i'm dancing <laughs> 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 maybe transition to pronunciation oh man let's uh let's have at it yeah yeah so right. where do we um so today I, do we want to preface mm-hmm. do you want to go that way or we can let's just let them in man yeah. Okay. So you sent some uh, excellent, very eloquent, also messages to me. That was they almost seems they weren't didn't seem prepared, but they were like very natural and very eloquent. What you you said to me in about um, ten minutes of uh, audio messages you sent me. So I wrote down notes, which I have here, about what you said, so we could talk about it today. And one of the things you're talking about was uh, a code switching. Normally, I think of code switching as, for example, someone who lives in Miami and they have Cuban family. So they are switching constantly their words between 
um, Spanish and, and English and uh, the Spanglish that people might call it, right? It would be a mm -hmm. kind of a code switching. Uh, but yes. I think code switching and also the ability to spontaneously change from one language to another. Sure. For example, one of these um, children growing up in that environment could speak with the teacher in English and then with the mother in Spanish spontaneously with zero effort. You and I, of course, right. knowing Italian, we can spontaneously switch into Italian and mm -hmm. English, and that's code switching as well. Yeah. Um, but then as far as the casual versus formal register, right? I call that term register. There's, mm -hmm. We call it whatever we want. It's just describing what it is, is and we'll use that term. So um, register or code switching, whatever you yes. want to call it. <clears throat> and we were, that was in reference to the pronunciation of final M when followed by a vowel. And that's, okay. and that's where... Okay. It, what, it is... Okay. It is... I guess it is, ultimately... So if I could just, mm -hmm. since I since I was the one who brought this up to you, um, what I was, uh, what my concern was or question was, and then it's then it turned into a concern, and now it's like a just an inquisition, not like the Spanish kind, but like I'm just like generally, like inquisitio, <laughs> inquisitive and curious, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. so it was. Um, oh gosh, which which word was it? Was it kertum? No, kertum was the tantum. one I found. It. Tantum. Okay. Yes. So we have tantumest, mm. or we have tantumst. Where in the first instance we have two distinct words, tantum with an m at the end there, so it's um, and then the the following word is est, est, and then so that so you have this one way of saying it, tantumst, or excuse me, uh, tantum est, where that m kind of gets eaten, right? Um, eaten, sorry, that so that's a, that's an Italian way of saying it. It's like un po mangiato. Mangiare. Yeah. Right, un po mangiato. Yeah, quella, sure. So, um, sorry, that's, that's English how, too. Yeah. Oh, so we say that too. Okay. Anyway, so it gets a little, it gets a little muttered, uh, mumbled. Well, okay. We see have this way of saying it. Well, is that what's happening though? No. Well, so yeah. Okay. It's now, not that it's getting eaten, in my opinion. Such as it is. So what you're going to do is, being, is you're going to explain okay. to everyone how the quality of it changes, and that's fine. But my and, and and I'm okay with that. Like, I mean, because certainly, and I've I've seen I've read the text and I've I've seen this thing happen over over time when we when we when we look at the progression of Latin as it becomes the Romance languages where the M's disappear on the accusative endings and then then we start getting our more like tantum becoming tanto right so and not just the Romance language we're taught 300 B the 300s B C Scipio an inscription right. on Scipio's. Uh, um, a grave, if, if I recall correctly. All, the M isn't written at all. On some, yeah. So, all right. So, like, already you have these wild variations all over the place. And so, what my issue was, or my question was, is like, sure. So, we have tantumst, where we've, you, it, I still hear the M, but the E is gone. And now we've, we've pushed the two words together and we've added an apostrophe mm -hmm. to show that they've been, been, uh, there's been an elision, which has occurred. I don't, I don't even like the apostrophe myself. But it's that's that's an orthographic choice, doesn't really Orthographic, matter. yeah. But then you have the other yeah. variation where it is where they're not put together, and and then what I found because initially to me I was thinking, oh gosh, do we have? Is this someone who is harkening back to uh, you know a Plautine way of saying things, tantumst? And now it's not Plautus is not the only one to say it. Of course, there are other authors, but. Mm -hmm. And is the other well, way a more sort of formal way? And that was that was my original. Yes, absolutely. But that but as far as that's being pronounced, that's I think where the the question lies. Or maybe. And, and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Jesse and I are great friends. I don't have a better friend of, of my uh, wonderful friends I have who speak Latin. Who is my you know my, my Latin buddy, my my Fra Moris uh, Fraterculus. <laughs> yeah. And. Um, <laughs> But, but we this is if you, uh, we definitely have some points of disagreement here, so we promise okay. not to end our friendship over this, um, right? I hope. Anyway, no, so yeah. Adelpe, me. <laughs> so my, uh, of course we would have, but uh, it's good. So good to have uh, disagreements in general and to talk through what they might be. So the um, what what is the difference when you're. Totally right, and you also found statistically that tantum est, or very similar words at least, um est, written um space est, mm -hmm. is more common than the contracted form. The contracted form, though, is not uncommon at all. It's very common. It's what very common, mean? yeah. 
Yeah, it's, it's they're relatively common. It's so the solution uh, then is what is happening. Well, we can actually, thankfully, because we're speaking of Plautus in particular, right? Mm -hmm. We can actually look at the meter. Now, the meter of these uh, verses shows that they are all contracted into one syllable. The pronunciation tantum est does not exist anywhere in any native speaker of Latin from 200 BC to 400 AD. It does not exist. They're all contracted consistently. Um, the pronunciation of final M as, it's, as a distinct consonant in front of a vowel is, on, is a medievalism and a renaissanceism. It's a characteristic of non-native speakers who don't understand this thing that was lost uh, to, to time. But we've regained it because the Romans, Quintilian in particular and others, clearly describe what's going on. Um, uh, so th that's so that's the issue, right? That's where I'm coming from. That this it cannot be tantum est ever in a Roman speech. But that doesn't mean that tantumst is the only pronunciation. Absolutely not. I would never say that. That would not be right. Tantumst is one version which we see, but mm -hmm. uh, or kertumst or whatever word it is, um, puelam, uh, whatever puelamst. I don't know. Um, uh, whatever it would be. That doesn't, yeah, that doesn't make sense. I put, forget what I said. Forget that it's I said fine. that, everyone. It's fine. I just, just keep moving. My promise. Yeah, keep going. Keep moving. Keep moving. <laughs> pay, pay no attention to that Nothing man behind here. the curtain. Anyway. <laughs> um, that's a great example of pulling something from cinema or literature, like from uh, Wizard of Oz, and that brings a comic effect, right? So that's why, yeah. that's why we have to be, uh, we have to know what we're referencing when we pull those things in. But anyway, that's the other discussion. So, so ad, ad what rem, other to the to the... Adren, mm. gratias, thank you. So what other realizations are there of this pronunciation? Many. It's really a rainbow. Uh, Tantus is no doubt extremely common and absolutely correct. But what else is possible? Mm -hmm. it, we can also have... So what are we talking about? Terms like elision are thrown around. Yes. Uh, eating of the final consonant or vowel or whatever, that's, that's definitely a term. I actually like that better than elision because elision is uh, deceiving or pro-delision, mm -hmm. which is a term that's given to the situation of removing the initial letter E or initial vowel in these situations. What are these situations? Well, these situations are the mergers of vowels at word boundaries. Mm -hmm, and as English mm -hmm. speakers or those of you who speak a Germanic language do not encounter this as often. We do do this. We have English them. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Right. But it's not codified into our poetry, for example. The fact that it's codified into Roman poetry and not into Greek poetry too, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Tells us a lot about the difference between the ancient Greek and, and what do uh, Latin you, languages. Can I so, grab you for two seconds? By what do you mean by what do you mean by codified? Um, can you? Uh, I elaborate mean, so on the, the poetry poetry evolves as an as a more artful organization of natural speech. Right. Poetry is a guide when, especially when poetic forms are first developed and are continuously developed in a very vibrant and active way. Mm -hmm. They demonstrate the, what's natural for those speakers to use. For example, mm -hmm. um, something that really that that occurs and is going away is the rhyming of again with aim, or not again aim with uh, with refrain or something in English. Whereas again, and at least in our American English, again does not rhyme with refrain. But you see that in songs, and that's going away. That's an archaism. Those do happen, but those are rare. Most of the time, you have it where a form of um, of poetry or song is emulating natural speech with some artifice, but not much. And so the point that I make is that the way that poetry is organized in Greek, ancient Greek, or it could be modern Italian or English or Latin, mm -hmm. is telling us a lot about how the language functions in its natural state. Yeah, Especially so... when... Go ahead. Oh, so I was just going to ask, though, because like, codification sounds like... So what that what that says to me is that there's someone who is currently or I mean. codified yeah. retroactively. No, it, no, no, no. Uh, they're not a person, but um, norms are developed. So you would say that there aren't being there aren't norms being developed in English poetry, whether it's by song or. <laughs> Have you seen any English poetry lately that's following any norms? I haven't. <laughs> yeah. So well, I have, man. So like I. Um, oh. So take for instance, I I, I listen to this is kind of going by. I listen to a lot of rap. Um, I, I got there's a period right like on. I was really heavy into it when I was younger. Then I got out of it, sure and then I then I'm getting back into the old stuff. So. But yeah, Absolutely, so yeah. What, what you can find there, though... I'm, saying, I'm sorry, I'm saying not musical poetry, but go ahead. With oh, oh, so not musical. No. No, no, no. 
Okay. You no, know, music is very, very standardized. The way that people write songs, which you know, the you have uh, an A verse, a B verse, a chorus, A verse. That's standard form of most songs uh, that are out today, and it's very folk song tradition. You know, it's a simple format, and it's very common. Okay. Rap songs have a completely different yes uh, way of doing things, especially in their ways of using rhythm. But rap music is a great example, and you brought this up in your messages mm-hmm. to me earlier. Yeah that rap music demonstrates how the people speak. And that's why it literally speaks to the people who started to first enjoy it. And then over time, things like jazz music are now normal across the world. But when jazz music came out, people said, oh, this is the end of music, you know, and mm-hmm. because it was, um, was very creative and also the style of singing and the scatting and, you know, these forms of the language, which is really as linguist people as you and I are, what is really interesting to us in the discussion is how the, I would say that rap music, on the whole, is showing how people are speaking with a little bit of artifice added to it, a little bit of a steady beat and other musical things that are added to it, right? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, and there, there are changes of words in order to make make rhyme schemes happen where you wouldn't know – like, in, in mm-hmm. a, for instance, in a rap song, you could have refrain and again. You could have those two words rhyming because they will – they'll twist it just a little to create right. that hook and, and then – carry you on into the next one yeah and that has to do with also the origin of it people who are mm-hmm. using the language in a way that's outside of standards that uh for example i speak general american english right and yeah. so that might be outside of what i th- would consider to be my vernacular but not out of the people who are writing these things they're True. used to something yeah. that's more flexible and um that's what's that's what's really interesting uh, about it and why now it's not it's something I think common to certainly young Americans. I think almost all young Americans can appreciate a few rap songs, if not very much like several of them. And like yes. I do, you do. Um, and that's just you know that's you know style and and you know, not style, but they uh, gustibus non est disputando. I didn't finish about tantums though. But yeah, so let's um, go back though and take that take that tantums. So, there, okay, so we're, we're talking about mergers of vowels mm-hmm. at word boundaries. Yes. So that means that, uh, so every time, with like two exceptions in the entire corpus of Latin literature, and I don't mean just poetry, but prose as well, there's almost no time ever that vowels are not naturally merged together in verse form or in prose. And I'm talking about prose too, I'm referring to Cicero, Salustius, almost every writer who's doing something formally is using clausulae, these endings to mm-hmm. the phrases which have a rhythmic effect. And in those situations, a final M always experiences, um, we were saying elision before. I don't like elision as a term because it's, it means cutting out. Mm-hmm. Elidere means to cut out something. Yeah. Now, we're not necessarily cutting out. And we have, this is an, a concept which is very alien to American and German uh, and English or whoever they are who are speaking Germanic languages and trying to speak Latin in a natural way because they are not familiar with what Italian and Spanish, for example, do without hesitation, which is the natural merging of vowels. In song, for example, uh, I use this Italian example a lot because it's one of the first Italian uh, music or, any, or words that I knew, which is um, the beginning of the aria um, Non Piondrai in Mozart's The Marriage of Figaro. Mm. Le Noce di Figaro, and it's, um, I'm going to sing it badly, so excuse me, but Non piondrai farfellone amoroso, and it's farfellone, butterfly, amoroso, but it's not farfellone amoroso, there is not a hiatus there, mm-hmm. they are written in the music, farfellone and a of amoroso underneath the same note, and that's, mm-hmm. why is that? Because so that's sing, that, sing that Italian piece again, let's naturally. hear it. Um, farfellone amoroso, farfellone mm-hmm. Yeah, so there, it's almost like a new diphthong or something. It's not a normal diphthong, but the point mm-hmm. is that it's both vowels are heard in the same syllable. So th- that's a demonstration of, of the range of what Italian can do. What else mm-hmm. could Italian do? It could say, farfellon amoroso, farfellon amoroso, like the final E might be elided completely, or we might go the other way mm-hmm. and say, farfellone moroso, farfellone moroso. I don't particularly like that one, mm-hmm. but has an Italian said something like that? At some point, sure. And depending on the word, those kinds of, the mergers of vowels at word boundaries are, I think, over, they're, they're, they're much is talked about them by people who have never experienced a Romance language, say Spanish and Italian so in particular. If we so can, not familiar that this is just a thing that's yeah. very easy to do. All the ranges are possible. Yes. If you can get both in there, so you were suggesting, why not? 
here is using the nasal final M, because final M, we presume, might be nasal or weak or something. Uh, yes. It acts like a vowel is the point. Tantwest. Why not tantwest? So the ones where you're reading two separate words, I would say tantwest. Tantwest. Or if you wanted to contract them, it would be tantunst. I compare it to the difference of, actually, it, that wouldn't be good, isn't, actually, that works, isn't or is not. Both are two syllables. Isn't. Uh, at least it sounds mm -hmm. like two syllables to my English here. Isn't. I think it scans as two syllables, but I'd have to check. Isn't. Um, Isn't. You might make it cram it into one syllable, Isn't. but it's not really mm. important. To my American ear, it sounds like two syllables. Like Isn't two. or is not. Is not is more formal. I say is not every day. I also say isn't every day. That's all it is. So do so you those think are the then, in register. Yeah. So do you think then that you'd have a tantumest and that might be a more formal, whereas tantum Not with the M at the end, though. It was not tantumest. Tantuest. Tantuest. Yeah, that's what I said. Tantuest. You remove the M. You can't have the M there. Tantuest. But tantuest. you're saying the M as well. It's nasalized, but you're saying it. It's, but it's, that's the difference. It's nasalized. But Producing, it's... putting a final M in there. And what, is, what that means is to put an M at the beginning of the next syllable of the next word that starts with a vowel, tantu mest. Tantu mest, doing that is called myoticism, and it's, a, uh, it's an error that the Romans said that this is what foreigners do, mm -hmm. like Greeks who aren't familiar, or Gauls who aren't familiar with what our language does naturally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know, man. So I, I still hear myself, so I can say, if you want, I could go really, tantum est. Now there is... There is enunciation on all. There's the M is getting hit, and then there's a pause in between, um, and so yeah, on. You, no one, you would say tantumest, 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 tantumest. Don't allow your lips to close all the way and try it. Tantumest, tantumest. You're closing. Tan, tantu lips didn't close, tantu and I still heard. I saw them close, <laughs> but they didn't. But so you, what you're seeing through this camera is different from what I'm actually experiencing. Because that M... That's why we have people around us. <laughs> and that's okay. But So what I'm telling you, though, is that that M was purposely produced differently from the original one that I said, in which case I had two words separated. Tantum est. That's different than that's, what I that's not produced what I'm talking about. I'm talking about words in conjunction. So they have to be together. And that's... And then, I'm and distinguishing... Right. Go ahead. And I'm that's what I did. I'm distinguishing between myoticism, which is tantum est. That's myoticism, tantum est. Yes. That's that that's that's my autism, but Tantwest would be what if the best realization I can do in the moment of mm -hmm. what this mm -hmm. should probably sound like. And I'm saying that this is the only possible version, far from it. And that's and that's a really a good point that you made in your comments to me earlier today, that saying there's only one variation is dumb, and I agree. Well, it now, I don't know that dumb. I said dumb, because I do have... No, no, no you, those are my, my words. Okay, and, yeah. And I, that's how I feel. Because I, I have a difficulty with absolutisms, unless it's like... I do, too. There are a few no, moments I, where I could, I might pull one out, but... <laughs> you, you generously ascribed my seeming absolutism to my <laughs> militarism, my, uh, the fact that I'm milito, that I'm a soldier. But no, actually, there's a great variety in our world... Our military world and uh so but before we lose I it wish though, we were more standard before we lose it because yeah. i don't want to like run away from it or like run around it because we're oh, like getting trust me, I haven't loved it. but like <laughs> so as as you mentioned before that that you have you have your register with is not and isn't and then we talked a little bit mm -hmm. about some of these songs um in english where we have this kind of register and that kind of register right could we permit then should we permit then that the tantumst where, the, where we have the, the, the full-on contraction and the E has been elided. I wouldn't keep the M in that, though. You, you have a nice, strong M in front of the S. I would nasalize the whole thing, which would be natural to an Italian speaker. Like, tantumst. insegnare. Tantumst. Tantumst. Not, like, uh, in Italian, we, say, we don't say insegnare. We say insegnare. Insegnare. It's a nasalization, not a strong in. Insegnare. In, right. Right. Exactly. Like, insegnare. So, tantumst. Tantumst without closing the lips all the way before the S. But would you say that that contraction would fall under and maybe a more colloquial, sort of informal, Absolutely. whereas the yes. other, okay. As much as the word isn't, a word that's common, but mm -hmm. not one you would write with, right? Right. Not, and then this is not, this is a poor metaphor, but let's just sure. assume that these are comparable. Yes. Uh, that isn't, 
you don't see isn't in a newspaper unless it's maybe an opinion column. And even then, if it's like a good opinion yeah, column, they'll so. write according mm-hmm. to certain uh, norms. But isn't and is not take up pretty much about the same amount of time to say. Sure. There's an yeah. accent difference, which is a problem with um, maybe this example. Because is not is accented on the not, whereas isn't is accented on the is. Go, go with one that's a little bit longer. Can't. That's can't. Well, that would be. Okay, let's do cannot. That works because there's three versions there. There's cannot, cannot, which is two words, and cannot, which is one word written on the can, or, uh, stressed on the can, I mean, written as one word, cannot. So there's cannots. Uh, can't doesn't work because then it's only monosyllabic. So maybe the difference would be best compared to cannot versus cannot. But that's a, no, I don't like that because that's a, where you place the accent is the, is, um, the comparison. Anyway, mm. these are all poor metaphors. Uh, but they're um, they're just some. I mean, they're approximations. Yeah. They're approximations yeah. to the situation that we're the, looking the at. The point is that the contractions are less formal, mm-hmm. uh, whereas the uncontracted forms um, are more formal, right? And that's I, we both agree, absolutely. So the, the point, though, is that they have to be in the same syllable. Whenever you have any vowels at a merger, not just the final m, of course. That's just because the final M is a representation of a vowel. Mm-hmm. The preceding vowel is what that thing is. The M is, is a markation that is not what it appears to be exactly. Or mm-hmm. to a Roman, it would appear like, oh, yeah, of course, just final M. Um, but this is also true for, in the English, just to show a comparison, what we consider to be a final M as English speakers is not what an Italian would consider it to be. Like, say, I say, I am, I am. But an Italian would learn in school that it's M with a duplicated M sound and a little vowel, a little uh, that follows, A little vowel right? at the end, yeah. And mm-hmm. that, for them, is proper. But is that English? Heck no. That's not proper English. That's with an Italian accent. That's a foreign... Uh, if the term barbarism is used. It doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It just means foreignism, mm-hmm. a barbarism. Mm-hmm. Um, so I am. To say I am is specifically a, an accent of... Uh, I'm sure my grandparents spoke that way. Sure. When they were speaking English. I actually don't know how good they got in English. I never met them before they passed. But so that's where... Uh, just to throw it out there. Mm-hmm. That's sort of tough for me to say. So I can... I, I understand what you're saying. And then certainly I, I see these things. I, I do this sort of thing when I'm speaking Italian. My wife, who is Italian, will do that sort of thing when she's speaking in English. She'll add things that aren't there. I add things. Or I'm really bad with consonants that shouldn't be doubled up. And, and I don't double when I should. But Oh, that's... Even Italians do that. Like, the, yeah. The so, and, I, and I'm just wondering, like, I think about my wife, and for instance, it's not because it, it's not because she's my wife, but I'm just saying, like, it, if she were to say, "I'm, I'm, I'm not happy," she doesn't speak that way, by the way. Oh, it, but should she do that? I don't adorable, think. Though. I don't think that I would be ready to say that you're not speaking English. I mean, I, perhaps if I were angry, we, we were but arguing. It's not native, is it? Well, her pronunciation, I might say, is not native, but the language is still English, right? Like, I don't know that I can jump completely on. I can understand why a person might be tempted to say that. I just don't know that I could personally do that. So the we're, vowels not alighting doesn't happen in Cicero. It doesn't happen in Sallust. It doesn't happen in any Roman poet, except for one Ennius I can think of. Uh, there's, uh, there are mm. occasional hiatuses, but those are pauses. Those are like they, uh, a comma or something where uh, it it's adds it, an unusual mm-hmm. emphasis. It is not natural to allow vowels to be unmerged at word boundaries. And this is true of Italian. And Spanish and Italian are outstanding models for the natural flow of, of the vowels between words. Those are the models used, the way Spanish does it. Um, an example would be, uh, what would be a good example? I think of, well, I'm you know, while you're, while you're thinking, thinking of the example, I'm just thinking, so it sounds to me like what you're proposing, though, um, is that there is... I, I want to be careful. I don't. I, if I were to use the word artifice, don't well, be careful. I mean, I want to. I want to be careful as far as I want to. I want to. What's the artifice? I want to speak precisely, um, is what I mean by careful. Um, but um, it seems like you're proposing, and maybe not just you, but like 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 it's being proposed here. So maybe others are like you are saying this, is that like even in prose mm-hmm. sure. that that what those authors are doing is that they're writing. Also, 
with sounds in mind, right? And so uh, they're, 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 you were proposing that there's a meter. Now, are you, now, I can understand, I could admit that there is a natural meter to the language. And so are you right. saying that, th- which is my, and so you were saying that that is amateur. their, that that is so maybe ingrained in them that they just naturally put in that meter when they're writing. Mm-hmm. Very much so. Is this educated, uneducated, or all forms, all forms of native spoken Latin, with no and exceptions, all have we just no? What? Why would there's? Is there an exception? In yeah. Italian and Spanish? So I mean, I can think of people who, when they speak in Italian. Um, who are very good about there being uh, a place, a sort of uh, a definite word break, right, in between in between sounds. So everything is very crisp, clear, and enunciated. But then I have so many. Now, the majority, though, and I grant you this, absolutely, the majority of my friends um, and family that speak uh, in Italian, there is a nice co- fluid continuity from word to word. Um, right. From vowel to consonant or vowel to vowel, even. Um, now, I don't know. I so I'm just thinking about when when a word ends in a vowel and the next word begins with a vowel. I do not always. Parla in italiano. Yeah, I don't always hear there being um, a change. Now you can hear that those vowels are very close to each other. It, it's not a distinct thing. And that's what's great about Italian as a model, I think, because it's showing us that you, the vowels are, you can, like in farfellone amoroso, you can pretty much hear both the A Yeah, I can hear that. Farfellone and, amoroso. Or, or, or um, parla italiano, parla, and the I is contracted into one syllable, but it's not parla italiano. That sounds a little off. Parla italiano. And I'm, of course, not a native speaker, but I'm attempting to approximate what a native speaker will do, which is the natural merger of ending vowel with initial vowel of the following word into Para one Italiano. syllable. Mm-hmm. Uh, reflected in the poetry, mm-hmm. in the music. I mean, we could bring up Dante. I mean, it's, it's there in all, all periods of, um, of the language. The mm-hmm. separation of the syllables is, uh, is, can be done, but it should be done with the idea that this is going to be emphatic somehow. I've done it in my translations mm-hmm. of Latin songs. Because it gives emphasis, and in the model of the what Romans do, like oh, like oh, I translated yesterday as oh, heady, oh, mm-hmm. yeah, like yesterday, and I did that knowingly that this is I've seen yeah. this in Virgil with oh, and then yeah. it's a hiatus, but it's a mm-hmm. hiatus. It's a very deliberate thing with uh, mm-hmm. with purpose, um, and I th- there's maybe one Ennius example has a meiotism, but uh, that's the only one that happens. Now, if what you're saying, what you were uh, saying before, that tantum est is a possible pronunciation that's more formal, it would occur in Cicero, and it never does. And that's my point, that this is something that's not yeah. just something mm-hmm. that's in poetry. This is so freaking fundamental yeah. to the language that it requires a particular amount of emphasis. You made another really good point after that was didactically, how much do we push this at uh, elementary levels of teaching Latin? And that's an uh, important question. And generally, I concur with what you were, you were saying there that, you know, how, uh, what am I going to, am I going to teach my students that there's a nasal final vowel that I don't even, I'm not comfortable doing really, and then have them pronounce it that way. And, you know, like, well, how far do I go with this thing that is alien to me? And I think that was more or less an argument that you made um, in your message to me earlier. A very good one, by the way. This is not, not yeah. a, a bad argument. It's an extremely good and important one to make. But then I would retort, <laughs> if you're teaching Italian, do you teach that Italian has a ra or that it says ra? Like, is, is, it, um, is it Ravenna or is it Ravenna? Like, that, mm-hmm. or is it, um, um, I'm trying to think of another Italian word that starts with an R. <laughs> Roma, do you teach that it's yeah. Roma? There is an Italian word. Or that it's mm-hmm. Roma. And as an Italian yeah. teacher, would you accept... Uh, not trilling the R. Would you teach them? Let's practice trilling the R. If the student doesn't get it, you know, we're not going to force them. Eventually, it takes a while, especially for older people, yeah. to get a trilled R. I didn't learn to trill an R until I was 20 years mm-hmm. old. It, until I was like 19, 20. I finally figured it out after a lot of like practice. Um, 
like commuting to, to college, I was going to do like a skull shucks and I wanted to say, <laughs> and um, it was a very offensive accent, I'm sure, for that <laughs> amateur theater course. But it was uh, <laughs> it was a lot of fun because I practiced with the yeah. and eventually I got it. But because I was learning German in high school, so I was doing Rah. I was not comfortable with that. But I did learn how. Now, I guess that's my question again. Would you teach if you're teaching Italian, would you or it's Spanish? Would you teach um, uh Roma right. or Roma? And that's, and that's not necessarily something you would answer now, but another retort to that would be, there are no native speakers, should we care? Right? That's a retort I've heard a lot. Anyway, I'll yeah, just go geez, back to I don't that. know, man, because that's sort of... I'm just trying to now see if, the, if those match up the same for me. What about La Mica? Like, would you teach... La amica, or la mica. Would you teach that it's contracted into la mica as the standard form? Uh, but this is a different from tantus because that's just sort of a, a vowel merge. But this is a true contraction that's obligatory. But would you teach that la uh, that um, like Spanish? Spanish writes la and then separated amiga, la amiga. But it's pronounced with the vowel merger, la amiga, la amiga. Saying la amiga is an artificial thing to steal since these are two words, and then every time you repeat them, la amiga, and then as Italian, la amica. What about amico, which is lo plus amico? Would you teach, is it actually lo amico, or would you just say it's L apostrophe in front of a masculine noun? L'amico. You know, what, is there any value to that? And this is just, these are rhetorical questions I thought of when, when you mentioned the idea of, should I say, I want to say tantum est because it's more pedagogically sound in my way of thinking. Anyway, so that's my retort when it comes to modern language pedagogy. Yeah. Do we teach something that's definitely wrong because we think our audience of, in our case, American students will understand it better that we sh and we shouldn't force them. But what should we model? Yeah. What should we talk about? And there's only so much time. These are all these questions. You brought yeah. Up so messages. that's so that's a really loaded question because it presupposes that that there's a, a general and overall admission that 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 is definitely wrong. And so it's just that tanto mest is definitely wrong. That I do assert all that. final. That is my opinion. Yeah. That there is. So it's just so what what you've got working. It, it's man, it's, it's a heck of a thing to try to unlearn. Yeah, and that let me let me help you with this because like right? one thing that you're like Go one ahead, thing man. that's working against you and people who are fighting the good fight like like you are doing with this and and certainly I've <laughs> I've tried to uh, I've tried to and you you can list, you can hear my stuff I've tried to uh, tone down my final M's um, because I've I've seen this and I understand. Um, where those M's go, what it becomes in the uh, in the later uh, later languages, but one of the things that w this mm -hmm. that's that's fighting against this is is the way we've been classically trained, right? So you have an M and an M has this pronunciation. Now, we were okay with I having two uh, qualities. We were okay with a U um, having two qualities. No one ever told us anything about this M. Um, you're, just, you're just speaking of the distinction between, um, for example, I would say sensit, but someone, an American uh, Latin teacher might just say sensit. And I oh, no. believe the latter is wrong oh, no. and the former is correct. Oh, that, no, my mean. friend. E and e, I'm talking qualities. about the quality of uh, the Italia or Julius. Italia, Julius. So I, I... Oh, consonantal I. Well, I'm not okay with that. I read a J for Well, see, there were, I, there were the, where was the J in antiquity, right? So, like, so one, we had that classical training that's just it's like fighting against us or whatever. Now, now that, now that is something which can be fixed, right? So we can go in and we can say, look, guys, you're okay accepting that there are two I's. You're okay accepting that there are two U's or two V's, however, whoever your teacher's doing it, right? You've either got a W or an U, and that's right, and we're, that's, that's, that's okay. So if you can handle those, let me give you two M's. Here's this M, right? Murmure, murmure, right? Mordere. And then here's this other M, which is going to be nasalized. So that, that could be fixed relatively easily. We'll explain to you, or we'll just show you how that happened. But then the other issue for me, man, is like when we have these Romans writing 
that M. Now I could I could make the leap so you could tell me that definitively it's always pronounced this way and here's the evidence for it. Um, and then so inscriptionally we can even though the M still appears and the Romans are really good about writing that M all the time, um, it, it really wasn't ever pronounced. So I mean I'm or at least if it was it had this quality to it, but not the one you're attributing to it, right? But it's just it's hard constantly seeing that M written there. And knowing how it's pronounced in all these other places, and no one's told you that it's supposed to be pronounced differently, and but now you're just supposed to, you're expected to, to know to pronounce it differently, in this position, which you get, like you said, what a pain in the butt when you get the poetry, and then they're like multum ile, and they're like no 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 multilet ah whoa, what happened to the m, and then it's yeah it it threw me I didn't believe it I railed for weeks in constant argument with other people about it because I'm, of course, an annoying know-it-all, so I have, <laughs> <laughs> I have to... T- <laughs> and, uh, and eventually I was persuaded by the ancient grammarians themselves who explained kind of the things well, I... Well, where could we, where could I, we go, uh, man? Where can we send now? listeners to, like... Quintilian? Yeah, I'll find the... Um, the can the, you ballpark us and kind of tell us, like, uh, roughly what he describe- says? Yeah, described as when um, when final essentially that when final M is a letter and another vowel follows, we don't pronounce a distinct M. I believe he someone calls it myoticism. I might be Quintilian in that part, but he says that's we don't do that. But we also uh, usually we don't allow it to completely erase the preceding syllable either. That the M written is someone actually decided to change the orthography to a half M. Because orthographic changes were attempted, they just weren't standardized by the manuscripts transcribers in the mm, centuries mm-hmm. later afterwards. So there was there's an orthographic J, an orthographic consonantal W that Caesar introduced, which is the digamma, and then they just fell out of favor for um, because of uh, habit and because of later people transcribing this stuff. That's the cause, not not the Romans not trying to uh, give a, a orthographic representation of these sounds. They tried to put a half M. For example, that's very telling. Um, and they said that it sounds like a different letter. That's what Quintilian said. It, that it, it's such that it does not sound like an M, that it sounds like a different letter mm-hmm. when a vowel follows. Now, I can accept something, which is that in isolation, I would tend to say tantum, which is what I'm doing is my lips aren't closing all the way at the very end, tantum, and I'm turning off my vocal cords at the end. This is in the model of Romanian with the final letter I, which is, uh, I'm trying to think of an example, um, uh, I can't think of any examples. Oh, here's one. Um, uh, Romanians is Rom- so a Romanian is Romin. And it's, my pronunciation is not great, but it's R uh, R O M A with an, a hat on it and then N. Looks like Roman, um, but it's so it's Romin. And the plural is Romin, and it's just like this his little h that's at the end, and it's a letter I that is pronounced, but the vocal cords have turned off. So that's one possible realization what if maybe by the classical period they were pronouncing the final m in isolation or at the end of a sentence not followed by a vowel but the sentence is over and there's a pause tantum with a firm m buellam maybe and and i think french is a good model which does the exact opposite french has a lot of t uh at the ends of words like um i don't know what's, what's a good example I can think of, uh, je, je dois penser en français. Um, uh, le, oh, or but just liaison is liaison is the term in French. So, um, the f- uh, so the friends is spelled L E S space A M I S. So it would be like amici in Latin, or it'd be like ili amici. That would be the Latin origin of it. Italian says gli amici. Uh, los amigos in Spanish, right? So what does French do? Les amis. But le, L-E-S, that S does not have a sound if a consonant follows. So uh, les frères, uh. the brothers. It's still L-E-S, but the S is not pronounced. So this is the exact opposite, almost the exact opposite mm-hmm. of what Latin is doing. But it comes from, it is completely natural to French, but it also is an educated pronunciation that a foreigner or a non, like, non, like, perfect French speaker before they all standardize into standard French would have to have learned. And that's 
very similar to this. Maybe, and I'm completely fine with it being at the end of a sentence or just in isolation, puellam, tantum, gertum, gertam, uh, sensim. But if a vowel follows, it must, must, must become one syllable. However you want to merge it is with me fine. Because if it's not merged, it's going to create a rhythm which is not right in the poetry. It's not right in the uh, rhythm of speech. It's not representing native speaker Latin. That would be like saying, les amis, which is not French, period. Oh, and I think every French speaker out there will agree with me that les amis is absolutely not French. That les amis is the only acceptable standard French version. We'll ask our uh, Canadian French speaking Latin speaker friend Aurelia what she thinks of. <laughs> she, she speaks with some of the I, dialect, but. I, I only think, uh, so I agree with you. The only thing um, that is, uh, that's a little offsetting is, and I think this is just, this just may be me. But when you say it's not French, I'm with you. You could, if you were to, if you were to finish that and say that's not a proper French French pronunciation. Right. But it to requires, say it's not it, French, yeah, I agree that, with you. I'm being that very is very severe. severe, and and you're pushing people to edges where, uh, you know, otherwise, they would have. Well, that's not a good French pronunciation. Can I help you here? You could, but if you say that's not French, and then they're they're gonna. Oh yeah. I'm not looking to make... They're, they're throwing like middle fingers and fists and doing all this stuff. And You're talking about the social implications of being disagreeable. And I, I concur that my, ass, my asserting that... Yeah, that my asserting, for example, in my recent videos on polymathy, I've showed how the disyllabic word uh, bona is two short syllables. And pronouncing it bona, which many Italian Latin speakers do, is wrong and is not Latin. I have said those very words many times. And I say that because someone has to. Someone has to stand up for what the language oh, really no, sounds that's fine. like I'm just nitpicking on t- your choice of words there to say it's not Latin. It's not no, good well, Latin pronunciation. Well, I'm not necessarily defending myself either. I'm just kind of elaborating mm-hmm. on what I'm doing. I am taking a very severe opinion where I'm not severe like this. I don't think I am with my students um, on something like that. I want to, what do I do as a, as a teacher or instructor? Yeah, I want yeah. to guide people. Now, you have a very strong uh, BS meter, which I love about you. And you have a very strong, um, uh, you, you despise rightly people who are trying to be know-it-alls. And uh, including this guy with two thumbs. I, I don't despise uh, you. I do, <laughs> hate the sin, not saying the center. It must be a certain way. Yeah. It's so I'm, I'm doing I'm doing this yes. deliberately to say that there is mm-hmm. like there is a huge amount of variety yes. here in mm-hmm. the language, and that's what I'm really excited to explore. Once certain things become norms across for more than just a handful of speakers, namely Raffaele Torrigiano. Um, and uh, Stefano, um, Stefano, I could say Rumac, Vittori, and uh, Ed, I, I could go on with a, a list of, of speakers yes. who, who yeah. do these things uh, fluidly. And um, Yanoko is another one. So these are, uh, so that's what, what they are. And it's just it, like if it weren't in the poetry, if it weren't in the literature, it would be, uh, it would, for example, hidden quantity, like I talked mm-hmm. about in my video is almost academic, almost. And I used to consider it that way. Like, I would do it, I would say actum instead of actum because I knew it had a long vowel and I was pronouncing it distinctly and I knew the Romans cared about it to some degree. And I, I certainly tell people that, yeah, this is a long actum and that actum, like that distinction is a big deal for the Romans, maybe, well, why should we care? Then when I saw that they put apices, the ancient version of Macron's, long marks on them, I was like, holy cow, ornamenta, ornamentis, with the long mark over the O. So, whoa, like to me, that's like, wow. So that's still, however, that said, even though I think it's important to explore that, is it important to poetry? No. Is it important to the prose? No. So it is way lower in my priorities. It is way lower in my priorities. Uh, I, l- trilling an R in Latin, I don't think there's any among us who can, who would say that Latin doesn't have a trilled R I R seem sound to like believe. I, I seem to recall having heard somewhere someone was trying to argue that the Romans didn't trill their R's. That's preposterous. But it's the most common. It's one of the most the, who, common. I don't recall who was the who's the author. They call it the um, litera canina, the canine letter. Like, come on. Oh, actually, that's not well. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, well, we could talk about that, but, um, 
what whatever makes a doggy sound i mean that's that's arguable but the fact it's it, mere existence in most of the romance languages including archaic french where it's become a guttural or, or uvular excuse me uh, similar to the german mm. sound actually the germans got it from the french which is another story i'm sure they would hate it to know that um <laughs> but uh the, it's commonness all in world's yeah. languages as well as it being well yes. described makes it by the mm. ancient romans gives it strong credence so that's the case but Let's say we all agree, I'm just putting out there, all of us listening and talking are agreeing that R is the sound of the Roman R to some degree, something like Spanish or Italian, pretty close. However, I say that is less important than syllable quantity in Latin pronunciation. That is way less important. It is less important than saying Cesar or Caesar or Cesar or Cesar or whatever, or Caesar. If you, if you say Caesar with the right syllable quantity, that is more important because that will give you access to the literature. All the other little things are trivial superficialities that, yeah, I'm interested in, but are those important to literature? No. If all this stuff about the merging of vowels at word boundaries were incidental and not a part of the poetry, I would say, nah. Mm. But it is. And that's why I make such a big deal about it to the point of annoying everyone, including my <laughs> And my parents. Oh, God, the poor things. They may listen to this and be like, <laughs> oh, Lukey. Hey, Mom, Dad, listen to this. It's in English. You'll understand yeah. it. Oh, oh Lukey, there he goes again. <laughs> You'll need subtitles. Um, no, it's great. So in that... And I'll, I'll let you cut in. I'm no, yeah, I think we can... So, wow, that's sort of that's sort of a lot to... Um, so while in on one breath, you we could tell someone... Oh, God, I shouldn't do this. I feel like I'm going to poke a bear when I do this. And I don't mean to, because... Poke, poke, poke bears... <laughs> Look at me, man. I've been poking bears all up in this place. If anybody still likes me after hearing all this, like I have a few, uh, um, we might call them asectadores uh, or asectai. No, asectadores. Asectai is oh, single gosh. fans. Asectadores are like, are like yeah. followers, like friends um, who uh, might be interested. But other than that, no, I no, no. Listen, I don't know. Okay. Le well, I, I haven't heard of anyone who hates you. But then again, I also just about only. And exclusively talk to you on a regular basis. So. <laughs> we, you promised to come to the colloquia this week. Come on well, Saturday. That's the thing. Yeah. Well, anyways, um, so let's get back to the uh, podcast. I know you've been but, um, just teasing. So yeah, no, I don't, you know, I just almost don't even want to, don't even want to do it. It's fine. It's okay. So you, you mentioned, I'm just reviewing my notes. You talked about absolutism. Yeah. I agree with you. So there's many things you say that are completely right about this that I'm not disagreeing with, which sh how big of a deal do we make about something like the final nasal M that none of us are necessarily good at as English whatever, speakers yeah. or Italian speakers or whatever uh, with our students when we're not, you know, that's not something that we're used to hearing or doing outside of my recordings yeah. or some of these other people I've mentioned. Um, like what, like how do we, how do we justify that? That's a really good point. And the other point that you make about absolutism is if there's only one, some one way or the highway, that's not great either for pedagogical reasons, and it's also linguistically unsound. I agree with you. There's got to be variation in there. So what I'm saying is it, just make it one syllable somehow <laughs> with the, ver the merging of final M or other vowels at, uh, uh, that are at word boundaries. That's all I am asking for and saying attend to that and to syllable quantity in general, long and short vowels, long and short syllables as assiduously as possible, and I don't care how your L's or your C's or your G's or your R's sound, not that much. I would say, eh, maybe it should be this way, but this is not going to help you in poetry. Huh. It's not going to help you understand the natural well, rhythm of it. So having said that, I think I think then, so then this word, we need to be getting this word out more, I mean, about these M's. We know that the M, we know that the M undergoes this process of elimination eventually from the language. Right. So... In Val, we call Val merger. Oh yeah, you're right. I'm sorry, you're right. The, uh, yeah. the Val merger. Or, or no, you're right. The elimination yeah. of it completely. It and it eventually gets knocked out of the way. So I, I don't think that there's anyone uh, fighting that. But what they, whatever, what we are fighting though is, I think it's kind of like the same thing that we're running into is that like sort of traditional. Now I'm using quote traditional unquote um, way of teaching the classics, teaching Latin. Um, I think we need to we need to get get away from that. And and just like we were doing those I's and those those V's or U's, however you wanna. Some people do U, some people do V's, whatever. However you, that's fine. Um, but I don't but care M's. That much. So can we just when you when you when you Latin teachers, 
university level, middle school, high school, whatever, preschool. Oh my gosh, please start them early. Can can we just talk about this M? And can you can we just distinguish? Luke told us that if the M, if it's a final M, and what comes after it is either a period or a consonant, then we can have a fuller M, right, being pronounced. But then if that M is um, but if that M is then followed by a word that begins with a vowel, that that M needs to be nasalized. So it's going to, it needs to be weakened, right? Is what we need to have, um, what we need to have happening. Yeah. So, and I think having that final M um, when, if it's preceded by that vowel, it needs to be nasalized and somehow weakened or, or something. Yeah. It, it needs to not be um, a consonant in the sense of it being a distinct boundary between vowels. The, the, the syllable needs to become one. Two syllables need to become one syllable, like a diphthong. Um, <clears throat> like maybe puelain, puelain, puelain. However one realizes that, there's a whole spectrum there. It could be puelan, or on the far side, it could be puelin, or I prefer something in the middle, puelain. But it just needs to be one syllable, not puelain, not puelain. Um, would be my, and that's where the variation comes in. That's why I'm actually really excited that so many people are attempting these things that I rant and rave about because uh, they, um, we're starting to hear different realizations of them. We might find one aesthetically pleasing and that will become the Latin of the future. We might find lots of variety which will express the variety of the ancients too. Uh, and that's, that's what I think is very exciting. So I'm not you know, I'm not saying there's only one. There's just some things that have to be. You're passionate, man, um, for sure. I believe that. Yeah, that's some, some absolutely. That's what about, what about oh, geez. Boys? Do we need to? I kind of. Well, that was the only. That was the only uh, topic left. I, we covered all. The the, but so, but so those are my topics. The, the things that I brought up to you. I mean, is there anything? Is there anything else that you feel is of more importance to discuss? Actually, I, I don't think that's much of a, um, a big deal. It, it's, it's a diphthong. It has to be long With in it, duration. All it's day. It's a diphthong. Way. And that's it. That's really, yeah. that's really the big part of it. Then, then we're getting into details, which I think are, are um, important, but less important than my other uh, hill. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> 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 yeah, so... Uh, yeah, that one's those diphthongs a e i and o e o i. They sound similar to our English i, like the eyes on my face, or uh, oi, like boy or toy. But I think I don't think they sound mm. like that either. Yeah, I'm not happy with those. I think that um, e sound that but, in the back there is. I think it's yeah. just a little. It's a little too much. Yeah, i, ending in i. I mean, it's not written like that in IPA in the International Phonetic Alphabet. It's written with. And eh, right, which is way, right, way, so way, 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 you're doing the consonant W plus a, like, um, like in the Spanish, fue, meaning he was, or way, fuit, right, in Latin, or way, yeah, yeah, um, so that, so it wouldn't be that, it wouldn't be fue, fue dos, it, you have to go o first and then open to e, foi. Foidus, foidus. Foidus. If foidus, you do the classic foidus, one, if you do Ecclesiastes, foidus, it's just foidus. Foidus. Yeah, foidus. Yeah, foidus. Right. It's a little Whereas, bit different, uh, a little bit more difficult yeah. when you do the battle one, right? Try that one. Proelium. 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 Yeah, pro Proelium. Eh, pro Proelium. 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 I just don't like the pro Proelium. Proelium. Foidus. That's yeah. archaic Latin, yeah. That, I just I agree with you. It's I not mean, a classic okay. pronunciation at all. <laughs> yeah, proilium, yeah, or proi, like English boy, proilium. proilium. That's something that I might do because I'm a lazy. Um, speaker oh my sometimes. gosh, please! We all yeah, are. There's I mean, no I, sense in. Yeah, and those of lis you listening, uh, you hopefully have heard me say enough that I I get stuff wrong all the time, especially and including the stuff that I think is important, um, but. I'm still emphasizing, I guess, what I think it is important for us to try because we're not. No, we're not because we're not Romans. We're right. Romans, I mean, Romans. I guess I guess um, what they should know, too, is like the same standard that you are waving 
in front of everyone else is the same one that you were clamoring behind also, right? And so, I mean... Right. I'm trying to, but I'm... but No, I'm, right. I'm and we're talking about humans, and no one is, and so... and Right. Yeah. I'm a foreign speaker. This is not, this is not my first or even my second language, you know? And it... Dude, I can't tell you how many times I've seen uh, self-professed um, world-class Latinists goof up. And it happens. But Oh yeah, mirabile. But like I'm not going to call you out on it because I don't think that that's appropriate. You know what I mean? No, no. No, we it's definitely we need to have a For God's sakes, Latins, Ro- Latins, pff, Romans were making mistakes. They were Latins, the Romans were Latins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean Latini. And and that's that's another thing too, like they that that people get so caught up in is like they they've put the Romans on a pedestal. Right. Oh, God. Mm. Those ancient Roman authors never made a mistake. Get out of here, man. Stop it. Stop with that mess. What's What's even worse? Have you heard how they've been trying to fix Cicero's lack of subjunctives and indirect questions like editors have been doing that it's over disgusting. the centuries? Yeah, dude, <laughs> it is. he screwed up. Well, they assumed it was a medieval error, you know, and I'm not sure where people stand on that necessarily, but it's probably a mistake to correct them. Yeah. Uh, also, you're talking about Latin, like uh, and it's been quoted before. And those of you. Who um, uh, who've gotten this far? Oh my uh, gosh! It's, yeah. yeah, we love you. You're, I I I mean, yeah, you're, this is not my podcast. I'm sending, I'm I love saying, you guys. Send up roses <laughs> with a little CR on them to every yeah, everyone. Just send your address. Don't God, please wait. wait actually, don't send your addresses. I do not need to know where anyone <laughs> lives. <laughs> so one percent of Latin literature is the classical corpus. One so percent. There's so much literature there. I mean, I've read. A smattering at best. I've read a Jackson Pollock's corner of, a, of the canvas of this <laughs> massive uh, work of classical right. literature. And it's only 1%. Well, where's all the rest? Yeah. It's late Roman. It's medieval. It's Renaissance. Yeah. The, uh, until a couple of hundred years ago, it just increases the amount of, especially after the printing press, right. the amount of stuff that's written in Latin in those time periods. Mm. So most of, and if, so another great thing that Martinus Loch, Marcin Loch, our uh, other Polish speaker Latin friend, all, all three of our famous Latin Polish speaker friends got mentioned by me today. <laughs> uh, Jan Oko and Katarzyna Ochman and Marcin Loch. Uh, so Marcin, uh, Martinus mentioned how if you go to Google Books, you can see how many books are, are there available that are just old books from like yeah. pre-1900 mm-hmm. and maybe a little bit newer. Well, there's a m- 2 million of them, and 1.1 million of them are in Latin. That's, fan- that's crazy. So the corpus of human literature, my, and like, that's crazy. The corpus of human literature is Latin, Latin. and that's nuts. Yeah. And that's what makes it so valuable. Yeah. And why... Um, and so 2% of Latin has been translated into English and other vernacular languages. Yeah. 1% of that's classical. The other 1% is, I don't know, uh, Isaac Newton, sure. and, uh, uh, Galileo, and some others around there, right? Yeah. So that's why we as teachers of Latin, I think you agree with me, we, we care so much about this language is a language which we as second language L2 mm. speakers can learn fluently, completely. Mm talk in it make jokes in it write books in it and that's what's starting to happen in the 21st century we're going to see many many new written works in latin which is awesome oh yeah uh there will be authors of latin living on mars the moon and the this century no doubt and in the coming century after that there will be so this is something that's going to keep growing and expanding and i love being a part of this cog in the wheel or this link in the chain yes in uh, the early 21st century so anyway i think it's pretty exciting yeah we just have to we we have to revisit your question your central question what started this whole podcast is what is latin can we just we need to redefine it because i don't think it is any longer what we used to say it is Mm. yeah that's a yeah yeah is pugio bruti latin i think so yeah and by the way can we just let me let me go ahead and plug it because i love Plug away. That book so much. Uh, Puglio Bruti is this uh, great little uh, text um, written by a friend of ours, uh, Daniel Peterson, and his um, and his girlfriend. Can you help me with the name? Amelie. Amelie. Uh, that's uh, right. Uh, R. Emily R. Amelie. Amelie or Amelia in Latin. Amelie. Sorry, Amelie. Um, Yes. Yeah, uh, I'm pronouncing it the French way. I don't know if the Swedish way. Is fantastic it. book, though, for any of you who are reading, uh, who are Latin students. Um, 
Rosengren. Yeah, there we go. All right. Yeah, Amélie. Yeah. I'm using the French pronunciation more or less. Hopefully uh, that's correct. Amélie. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Ro- uh, Rosengren, maybe. That's. I don't know the pitch accent in Swedish, but I'm sure it sounds beautiful and lilting. But um, mm-hmm. Daniel Pedersen and Amélie Rosengren. Yeah, fantastic takes. Um, so, anyways, check that out. Yeah, she was the illustrator. She was the, Did fantastic work there yeah. too. Um, didn't he just he just released a uh, his oh yeah he's got the course out now for the book. Of course. Yeah, a whole course. Yes, which many of our friends have lauded. I'd uh, be interested to try it myself. Yeah, I got he it. Uses a course based on the book. Yeah, yeah. I started uh, started working through some of it. Um, oh, cool. Just to kind of because I want to see about using it in my class, man. It's um it's quality oh, stuff. Yeah. He gives you grammatical descriptions, so even if you're even if you're still um, unsure about jumping on the uh, uh, oral Latin, the speaking Latin train, then um, you know there's something there for everyone. So it's really um, really well done. Uh, the videos, the the images, the the quizzes, it's it's really good, really really well done. Yeah. Neat, cool. Well, you convinced me. Bene. <laughs> I don't know, man. Ver bene. Well, what do you uh, what do you say, my friend? Shall we uh, shall we call this one? I I had a blast. This Thank is you good. for letting me uh, flail my arms, which no one got to see. Oh my god! I saw it. it. <laughs> Too bad I wasn't recording the video. <laughs> well, I don't have a wife and kids, so I have to care about something. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully someday. Hopefully they all speak Latin too. Oh my gosh! Yeah, we'll that, that's a, that's something else too. I've... Teacher Gemellas Latin. They they know how to say salvate plurimum. Um, they well they are I'm sure the most adorable <laughs> twins. Ever, yeah. They know how to say nomen mihi est magister craft. They can do it. Oh, oh good. my gosh, dude! Yeah. I hope they don't know how to say uh, tu transilis uh, muros meos ego te <laughs> which would be what oh, Romulus gosh. said to Remus before he smashed his head in. Yeah, he did a he did a Hulk sm- a Romulus Romulus smash. <laughs> <laughs> oh. let's get ready to rumble oh my gosh okay well bum, guys bum, um bum, 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 bum. luke my dear my my dear friend thank you so much Carissimo. um Gracias. we should do this i really want to do this again um part one of 26 yeah <laughs> stay tuned <laughs> <laughs>